Hello everyone and welcome to Python Level 1. We've already learned so much that it may seem a bit crazy that we're only now reaching how to learn and how to code in Python. Because Django is completely based in Python and for a majority of the course from now on we're just going to be working with Python. But your previous programming experience with learning JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and those fundamental coding ideas is going to help make learn Python a total breeze. So over level one and level two, we're going to be covering a lot of the same general programming topics from JavaScript, things like for loops and while loops, etc. So we won't spend as much time in Python talking about the very basic ideas of what a for loop is, or what an array is, or what those basic ideas are. Instead, we'll just show you more of the syntax of how to work with those ideas in Python. And then we're going to expand on these ideas to learn about object-oriented programming, something we haven't talked about yet. So if you've already taken a Python course, you may already know a lot of what we're going to be covering, especially if you've already taken one of my Python courses. You may find it easier to skip ahead to a section instead of starting from the very beginning. Let's outline some of the topics of both level one and level two to give you an idea of where to start if you already have some experience. In Python level one, we'll start by talking about basic data types of Python. That includes numbers, strings, lists, and dictionaries. Then we'll talk about tuples, sets, and booleans, control flow of Python and how it uses indentation. That's things such as the if, else if statements. Then we'll talk about functions of Python. Then starting at Python level two, we'll talk about scope with Python. We'll discuss object-oriented programming with Python, errors and exceptions, decorators, and then regular expressions. Utilize the curriculum outline to jump to the lecture you feel is the most appropriate starting point for you if you already have some programming experience with Python. Or, if you are a complete beginner, feel free to just start from here and continue on. It has been a really long learning journey so far just to reach this point, so I really want you to take the time and congratulate yourself. Everything you've learned so far is challenging material, so remind yourself that you are awesome for making it this far into the course and give yourself a huge pat on the back. Okay, Python level 1 and 2 are the only things standing between you and the main course topic, which is Django. So let's dive straight into it and get started by setting up Python and the Atom Text Editor in the next lecture. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Python installation and setup lecture. For this course, we're going to be installing Python using the Anaconda distribution. And all that means is a distribution is just a version of Python that also comes pre-packaged with additional useful libraries. Now the Anaconda distribution is actually quite large, so we're going to be leaving the full download of it as optional. I'll show you the full download site. You can go ahead and just click on the graphical installer if you want, but we're going to be showing you also how to install what's known as Miniconda, which is just a smaller version of Anaconda without so many of the additional packages. That way, if you don't have a lot of space on your computer, you can just download that. Again, if you already have Anaconda or Python on your computer, feel free to just skip this installation lecture, but make sure to watch towards the end where we show how to set up and configure Atom to have a terminal. Okay, let's get started by going to Google in our browser. All right, here I am in my browser. So go to google.com and then type in Python Anaconda, hit enter, and the very first link should be the continuum.io slash downloads page. Click on that. And this will take you to continuum.io slash downloads. And here you'll see download Anaconda now. And it has the download links for Windows, Mac, and Linux. If you scroll down here or just click on these links, it will automatically take you here. But let me zoom in a little bit so we can see this clearly. Here are the download links for Anaconda, which is the Python distribution for Windows, OS X for Mac, and Linux. Now for this course, we will be using Python 3.6. And we're basically going to require you to use Python 3.6 because Django in future versions is going to be dropping support for Python 2. It's one of the first main libraries to just be completely dropping support for Python 2. They're really pushing towards the future here. So because of that, we will be using Python 3 for this version of the course. Now Python 3 and Python 2 are extremely similar. And I will mention some things as we code along through the course, some key differences between them. But again, they're very similar. But for our future proofing of this course, we're going to be using Python 3. Now, if you're on Windows, all you have to do is download this installer. Remember to choose the correct 64-bit or 32-bit installer, and then just double click on that executable file and follow the instructions on the screen. If you're on Mac OS, you can come here, click on the graphical installer for Python 3.6, and then download it, 
double click on the .pkg file, follow the instructions there. If you're on a Linux computer, it's also very simple. You just download the installer, and then in your terminal, you type in this command right here, bash, and then the actual .sh file that you downloaded. Okay, so those are the full versions of Anaconda and the Python distribution. These are essentially the easiest to install. So you just download and follow the instructions. But you'll notice that they're quite large. They're about 422 megabytes each. If you scroll up a little bit, you should see a link here that says try Miniconda. And that basically saves disk space or just download time. Click on that link, Miniconda, and it will take you to this page where it has the installations for, or the downloads for Miniconda for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Now, if you're on Windows, it has an executable installer. So again, all you have to do is click on that and then follow the instructions. For Mac OS and Linux, they're both bash installers, which means those are command line installers. If you don't know how to do those or use those, all you have to do is click here on the quick install page for installation instructions. And this has the full installation instructions. If you're on Windows, all you have to do is essentially double click that executable file that you download and follow the instructions on the screen. If you're on Mac OS and haven't actually done a command line install, it's actually also really simple. All you have to do is go to your browser, download the Miniconda installer, and then you will end up downloading this .sh file. Let me zoom in a little bit here so we can see it clearly. So you will download this .sh file, and then what you will do is in your terminal window, and you can just do a spotlight search for the word terminal, and it will bring it up directly into your terminal, wherever you saved this .sh file, put it there, and then what you're going to do is say bash, and then type in right here, whatever file you downloaded. And it may not look exactly like this, it's here it says latest, but whatever your file is called, just type it there. Then you just close, reopen your terminal window for the changes to take effect. Sometimes you may need to restart your computer for the changes to take effect, but usually just restarting your terminal window will make that happen. And to test your installation, you just enter the command conda list. And if you're on Linux, I assume you've probably done this before, but all you have to do is the exact same thing for Mac, bash, and then the .sh file. All right, if you have any questions on the installation or are having trouble with it, feel free to post to the Q&A forums. A lot of times, some students on older operating systems will have issues with an installation. Maybe you're on Windows 7 and you haven't quite caught up there yet, or maybe you're confused whether you have a 32-bit or 64-bit computer. Any confusion, any questions, feel free to post to the Q&A forums. I'm always happy to help you out and get Python and Anaconda working on your computer. Okay. Now let's hop over to the Atom text editor to show you how you can install a plugin which allows you to have a terminal or command line prompt right in Atom. I'm going to hop over to Atom now. Okay, here I am at the Atom text editor. You may have noticed that as I've been using the Atom text editor, I have a little plus sign here. And if I click on that plus sign, it gives me a terminal where I can type Python and then actually start using Python command prompt directly in my terminal here. So let's quit out of that. What we're going to be doing is showing you how you can install a terminal and install some plugins that will make working with Python with Atom a lot easier. So at the welcome guide, what you can do is click here on install a package and then open installer. If you can't find this welcome guide page, then all you have to do is click here, file, go to settings, which is control comma or command comma, and then click here where it says install. And what you can do with Atom is search for packages that other people have created or that GitHub has created that allow you to add really useful tools for Atom. The first thing you want to do is actually get that terminal. So type terminal, hit enter, and it will search for packages for terminal. And the terminal package we're going to be using for this course is called platformio-ide-terminal. So what you will do is you will click the install button for that. And then you may need to refresh or restart Atom for the effect to take place. So you will have a little blue button there. Go ahead and install it. It'll download it from the internet and directly install it. So that's the terminal package we're using, platformio-ide-terminal. Once you've installed that, you should be able to click on a plus sign here and then open up a new terminal. The next thing we're going to be doing is searching for Python in packages. And we want a Python package or Python plugin, excuse me, that actually helps you autocomplete. So there is already built-in Python language support in Atom. You should already have something that looks like this downloaded. But I also like the autocomplete-python package 
which helps you autocomplete variables, methods, and functions. Feel free to install that as well. And if you really want to explore the power of Atom packages, search for Django. And a lot of people have made other useful plugins and packages for Django. I've downloaded Atom Django and it helps you just build Django apps faster with Python. Um, that's not required, but you can go ahead and explore it. There's also templates, language, Atom support, a lot, a lot of packages here and plugins that you can explore. All right, so if you are not on a Windows computer, you can feel free to skip to the next lecture. But if you are on a Windows computer, I wanna quickly show you how you can change what command prompt or what terminal or what PowerShell your actual platformio-ide is using. So initially, by default, this new terminal will use something called PowerShell in Windows. What we want it to use is the command prompt. So we need to change the settings for that. Under here, in search packages, begin to search for terminal, hit enter, and you should eventually see the platformio-ide terminal that you installed. Click on settings here once you've installed it, and it will take you to the settings page. Scroll down on this settings page, and then what we're looking for is this shell override. So we want to override the default shell instance to launch. And what you should do is on your computer, you need to find the cmd.executable file. And almost always it's under the system32 folder. In fact, you should be able to just type this directly into this shell override and then have it set up. So take your time, pause the screen if you need it, but set the shell override to be C Windows system32 cmd.exe. And that will change the terminal from being PowerShell to being the command prompt. The reason we do that is because sometimes the Conda virtual environment won't work with a PowerShell. And we'll be showing you how to use that in a subsequent lecture during the Django section of the course. So this really won't affect you right now for the Python level one and Python level two. But when we start talking about Django, it will affect it. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly note that for Windows users. Thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Again, any questions, feel free to post to the Q&A forums, and I'm always happy to help you out. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part one, numbers. Numbers in Python have two main forms that we're going to be working with for this course. That's integers and floating point numbers. Integers are whole numbers, and floating point numbers have a decimal in them. So for example, an integer is something like 23, a floating point number is something like 23.5 or 23.0, etc. All right, let's quickly walk through examples of some very basic arithmetic for Python. And we're also going to be covering variable assignment in Python and what makes it a dynamic programming language. Let's hop over to the Atom text editor to get started. Okay, here I am at the Atom text editor. Before we get started talking about numbers, integers, variables, and floating points, what I wanna quickly discuss is the various ways you can run Python and play with Python. One way is to directly in your command prompt or terminal, just type Python. And if you've downloaded Anaconda, it should be set to the path, so you immediately see Python here. And you can directly type Python now into your command prompt or terminal, which means I can do something like this. I can say print, parentheses, and in quotes, hello world, hit enter, and I get the output, hello world. So that's just the basic hello world with Python. Or I can type two plus one, and since this is in the terminal or command prompt, if I hit enter, it directly gives me an output. In a script, it would not give me the output. I would have to say print two plus one if I was running a .py script. So let's show you how you can run a .py script. To exit out of this, you can just type quit, open and close parentheses, and now you've quit. And if you wanna clear the screen, you can do CLS or clear, depending on your operating system. All right, so to actually run a script, what you need to know is the current file path you are in. So you can type PWD if you're on a Mac or Linux, or for a Windows computer, you should be able to just see it directly to your left, the entire file path. If you're unsure, you can always type CD, hit enter, and it outputs the file path right here. You'll notice that on my command prompt, I have something here in parentheses saying my Django ENV. That's a virtual environment I've set up. We'll discuss that when we talk about Django in a future lecture. You don't need to worry about that right now. All you need to know is being able to access whatever your current directory is, which is just CD and then it should output the directory or PWD if you're on a Mac or Linux. So what you need to do is create a folder here or add this folder 
to your project folders in Atom. You can see here I've already added it, but if you needed to add it, you could just right click here and then select add project folder and then find this folder. What I'm going to do is under that project folder, I will right click, say new file and create a file. And I'm going to call it numbers and I will make sure to give it the extension .py so that Adam knows it's a Python file. And so that Python also knows it's a Python file. Now let's discuss some very basic arithmetic. For a basic arithmetic, addition is just two plus one and I can zoom in here a little bit so we can see it clearly. Two plus one is addition. Subtraction is just a minus sign. Multiplication is just an asterisk. And division is just a forward slash. Again, I'm not running these commands because they're so basic. And we covered a lot of this when we were talking about JavaScript. For actual powers, that is something like two to the power of five, you just have two sets of asterisks. So this right here is two to the power of five. And if you wanted to, you could also do roots this way. So maybe I want the square root of something. I can do four to the power of 0 0.5. That's the same as the square root. But later on, we'll show you how you can import the math module to do some more complicated maths and then take the square root that way. A couple more notes. Order of operations is followed in Python. So things like multiplication happening before addition or subtraction, that's all followed. So if I were to say something like two plus 10, times 10 plus three. Let's print this whole thing out and see what we get. So I'm going to print this, I will save it. And then if I wanna actually run this file, all I have to do is at my command prompt, type Python space, and then the either the entire file path to the actual .py file, or if I'm in the same location as the .py file, just the name itself, so numbers.py. Then you can always do tab to help autocomplete this. Hit enter and we see it's 105. For order of operations though, if I wanted to affect this, I can always use parentheses. So let's say I want the actual addition to happen first. So I want two plus 10 to happen first before 10 and 10 get multiplied. Then I can just add sets of parentheses there to make sure that happens. So if I run this again, hit up on my arrow key, now I get 156, so a little bit different and you can just use parentheses to specify the order of operations. Okay, now let's talk about variable assignment with Python. Python is a dynamic programming language, meaning you don't need to declare what a variable type is going to be before you actually just do the assignment. So Python variable assignment is very simple. All you have to do is choose the name of your variable. For instance, A, set it equal to whatever you want it to be. For instance, the number five. And all those tabs that were popping up, that's just Adam auto help there that we downloaded one of the plugins. Don't worry about that. You can just uh, continue on without it. Later on when we work with functions and object oriented programming, it's gonna be really useful. But for right now, you can just ignore it. If I wanna see the output of this, I can just say print A. Let's save that. Run our script, which is python numbers.py. And here we see the output five. I can then also add objects together. So for instance, A plus A, save it run this and I get 10 out. Python also supports reassignment, meaning I could do something like a is equal to a times five. And then I could say print a, and now we would expect it to give out not just 10, but also 25. And if I ever wanna make a comment in Python, I just need to do a hashtag and then type whatever comment I want. And as a quick note, by convention, usually you type comments above the code it references or right next to it. Okay, so that's the very basics of variable assignment and comments. There are a couple of rules you need to follow when creating variable names with Python. For one thing, Python variable names cannot start with a number. So you can't say something like two dogs is equal to two or something. Um, what you would need to do is say two dogs is equal to whatever you want. Now keep in mind, usually when you're typing in Python and you have multiple words in your variables, you wanna separate them using an underscore. And this is known as snake casing. So you would usually see something like this instead of camel casing, which is common with JavaScript, which would do something like that. And we'll discuss these rules later on when we talk about object-oriented programming. But for right now, just keep in mind, variable names cannot start with a number. They also can't start with uh, certain symbols and these symbols are in your notes, but it's usually pretty obvious stuff. 
anything that's a shift on a number. So you can't start it with basically any of these symbols right here. Otherwise, it'll mess up the variable name. OK, now let's walk through a very quick example of using object names for variable assignment. I'm going to do a very simple example with my income equal to 100. We'll say my tax rate is equal to 0 0.1. My taxes is then equal to my income. And we can see here I'm being helped out multiplied by tax rate. And then I'm going to print my taxes. We'll save that, see what we get when we run the script. I get 10.0. So notice I'm getting a floating point number. The first number was an integer. Second number was a floating point number. When I multiply them together, Python automatically makes the result a floating point number. OK, that's really all we need to know about numbers and variable assignments for now. Hopefully it was pretty straightforward. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part two strings. Strings in Python are used to hold text information and are indicated with the use of either single quotes or double quotes. They are a sequence of characters, meaning they can also be indexed using the bracket notation. Let's explore the basics of strings, some useful methods and more with Python. Let's go to the editor now. Okay, so in this lecture, we'll cover some string basics such as creating strings and printing strings. Then we'll talk about string indexing and slicing, some basic methods for strings, and then how to use print or string interpolation. Okay, so to start off with the very basics, with a string, you can either use single quotes like this or double quotes like this. And if you want a single quote or double quote within a string itself, just use the other quote to wrap it. So what I mean by that is, if you wanna type something that says, I'm a dog, and you want this to be a string, notice it has a single quote inside of it. So you can just wrap that in double quotes and now it's a string. So you don't get an error with this single string or single quote right there. All right, those are the string basics. Now, something that is sometimes confusing to beginners is how to actually index and grab th things from the string sequence. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about that. And to show this, since the basics are almost the same as JavaScript, let's show some indexing with an example. I will say my string is equal to A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then let's print my string. We'll save that. And down here, this is saved in a file called strings.py inside of this folder location. So I will say Python strings.py, hit enter, and I get out my string. Perfect. If I want to actually grab a single element, all I have to do is use the square bracket notation and then pass in the index location of the actual element I want. Indexing starts at zero with Python. So if I want the very first letter in the string, which is A, all I have to do is pass in in square brackets after the variable name, zero. And then that returns A. If I want the very last one, Python strings support negative indexing. So I can type minus one, which means if I run this now, I get G out. And if I want anything else in the middle, then I just count it's in this index location. So for instance, if I want the letter D, that's at index 0, 1, 2, 3. Pass in 3, and I should get out the letter D when I run this script. And there it is. OK, now let's talk about slicing. Slicing is something that confuses beginners at first. So let's make it very clear by breaking down the steps. There's going to be three parts to slicing. The beginning of the slice, the end of the slice, and then later on, the step size. We don't need to always define the step size. So let's start off by defining the beginning of the slice. If I want to grab everything starting from the index two all the way to the end of the string, then I just have to type in a colon. So if I run this right now, I get the letters out C, D, E, F, G. And basically what this command says is start at index two, which is the letter C, zero, one, two, and grab everything all the way to the end of the string. That's what the colon here stands for. So let's imagine I want to grab everything from letter E all the way to the end, so E, F, and G. Then I just need to count out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and a colon to go all the way to the end. And if I run this, I get E, F, G. All right, now let's discuss how to do slicing if you want to start at the beginning but go up to a certain index. The way you do that is you essentially reverse this. So you say colon, and then type the index you want to go up to. 
But this is sometimes a little confusing for beginners because indexing starts at zero, Python is going to grab everything up to, but not including that index. So if I run this command right now, colon three, it goes A, B, and C. You may have expected D, the letter at index three, to be included. But for Python index slicing notation, it only goes up to, but not including that index. So again, what we're here telling Python to do is to grab everything from zero up to, but not including index three. And you'll notice this a lot in Python, where statements are usually in the context of up to, but not including. And that main idea is because indexing starts at zero. And moving along, we can expand this idea to define a starting point and define an ending point. So let's imagine that I want to grab the letters C, D, and E. What I have to do in this case is define the starting point, which happens at index two. Then I write a colon and define the ending point which is up to, but not including a particular index. So we'll see zero, one, two, three, four, five. So I wanna go up to, but not including five. And this should get me these three letters, C, D, and E. If I run this, there is C, D, and E. So take your time with this. A good practice for you, if you're having trouble with this slicing notation, is to make a really long string. And then in your mind, think of some letters you wanna grab in the middle of it, and then practice grabbing them. Okay. So the last thing I wanna mention about slicing is that you can actually define step size. So if you wanna grab everything in a string, you just have to say colon colon, or even just a single colon, and that will return, if we run this, the entire string. If you wanna define a step size, what you do is you say colon colon, which basically stands for all the way from the beginning, all the way to the end, and then a number or integer for your step size. So if a step size of one, it grabs everything. But if I make this a two and then run the code, it ends up skipping every other. So the step size becomes two. It goes in jumps of two. So A, C, E, G. Okay, those are the very basics of slicing. And we'll talk about it more when we actually deal with strings in Django, but that's all you need to know for now. As a quick note, strings are immutable, meaning I cannot say my string, grab a particular index location, and then try to redefine it. So I can't say something like my string of zero is equal to X, because if I try to run this, I will get an error saying str or a string object does not support item assignment, meaning a string is immutable in that fashion. I could always redefine the string to be something completely different, but that will just delete everything and redefine the variable itself. Okay, now I wanna talk about a couple of basic methods that are built into strings. A really useful method sometimes that you may find yourself using is upper. And upper is a method, and you can actually see Adam is beginning to help me as I type upper here. But what it does, is it returns a copy of the string converted to uppercase. So we can save this, and let's define this as x, and then say print x. So I will save this and run it, and now I see I get an uppercase version of a, b, c, d, e, f, g. And the opposite of upper is lower. Whoops, spelled that wrong. Well, we can see right there, lower. And you can actually see that as I say my string dot, I get a bunch of methods available for me. Uh, Adam is helping me out here. We won't use a lot of these methods, but remember that they're all here to help you. If you have any questions on one of these methods, feel free to post to the Q&A forum. But a lot of these will actually be defined as you begin to type them out. So let's say I wanted to learn what capitalize does. Well, then I just start typing capitalize. And as I do that, we see right here what's known as the function or method doc string and it tells you it returns a copy of the string s with only its first character capitalized so unlike upper if i'd select capitalize and then run this i notice that only the first letter a is capitalized and that's the difference between capitalize and upper the last method i want to show you which is really useful is the split method which ends up splitting a string so if i just run this right now i get a single item in a list. But let's imagine I had multiple words here. So I say, hello world, save this and run my code. Then I get a list in Python, which we'll cover in the next lecture that has hello as its first item and world as its second item. And basically what split does, it allows you to split on anything you want for a string. And we've actually used this before uh, in a similar case in JavaScript, but let's imagine that I wanted to split on 
the letter E. By default, it splits on white space, which is why we got hello world. But if I wanted to split on the letter E, I run this and notice I get back H. The E is popped out because we split on it and then everything else becomes a second item in my list. I could also do it for something that shows up more than once, such as O. And now if I run this, I get hell space W space, uh, next item is RLD. Okay, so that's the basics of split. Finally, I wanna talk about print formatting with Python. So let's show you how we can do that. So there's many methods that you can use what's known as string interpolation, which is basically trying to input a string into another string. The best way to do it is with the dot format method. And I will show you the basic way to do this. You say some string, so I will insert another string here, and then you have curly brackets, note the syntax highlighting there, and then off of the string, you call format, and then pass in whatever you want to insert. So we'll say insert me. Save this, and now let's run this. And we haven't actually printed this yet, so let's say this is equal to x, and then print x. Save that. Run this, and now it says insert another string here, and it ins says insert me. Okay, perfect. Now let's say I wanted to insert multiple strings. How do I do that? Well, all I have to do is say item one, and then just pass in, let's say item two, another set of curly brackets. And over here in format, we just pass in multiple strings. So we can say something like dog is our first item, comma, pass in another string, cat as a second item. We will save this and then we can print X and we get item one, dog, item two, cat. What's also nice about this dot format method is you can actually define variables inside of this format. So I can say something like X is equal to dog and then Y is equal to cat. And then inside of these curly brackets, I can pass in X and Y and it will come back here to format and read what X and Y stand for. So if I save this and run this, I get back the exact same result. But what's nice about this is I can easily switch out the order or double up on things. So I can switch out the order here. And if I run this now, I get item one is cat, item two is dog. Or I can have them both print out X, which is dog. So then it says item one dog, item two dog. And this is how you're gonna see format most of the time. It's curly brackets, a specific variable that you defined over here in format, and then you just call it there. Okay, that's the very basics of string formatting and strings in general. If you have any questions, feel free to post to the Q&A forums. But as far as this course is concerned, that's really all you need to know. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part three, where we're going to be discussing Python lists. Lists are Python's form of arrays, and they behave very similarly to a JavaScript array. What we're going to do is begin to understand their important features with Python by jumping to the editor and getting started. Okay, so let's begin by showing you how to create a list. Creating a list in Python is really simple. You just type in whatever you want the variable to be, equals, and then you use square brackets and separate every item in the list by a comma. So for instance, here's a list of the numbers one, two, and three. Now we just created a list of integers, but we can also create a list of many different object types. So for example, I could say my list and have it hold some string stuff, maybe some more numbers, integers, some floating point numbers, and then later on we'll see how it can hold a booleans and more. So again, we can have mixed data types inside of a list, and we can even have a list nested inside of a list. So this is totally good code and it will work. So let's actually run this to verify that. I'm going to call Python, and then I call this script list.py, hit enter. We don't get anything out because we didn't print the list. So we can do this, print my list, and let's comment this one out. Again, that's just command forward slash, hit enter, and we see that the list has no problems being printed out. And just like a string, we can call the len function on it. So length of my list, and let's now use the more normal list, one, two, three and actually print out that length, and we see we have three items in the list, one, two, and three. Okay, indexing and slicing works basically the same as it did in a list, or excuse me, in a string. So I'm going to redefine list to be A, B, 
and then whoops comma C if I want the very first item in the list I just have to use my list zero so let's print that out and confirm this should return a so if I run this hit enter I get a back if I wanted C I could just say negative one and that would give me back the last item in the list and to add a couple more terms in here so we can see how slicing works not just indexing if I have a b c d e if I want to grab everything starting at index one all the way to the end again it's just one colon and that will give me b all the way to the end or if I want everything from the beginning up to but not including index three so this should be a b c I get a list a b c all right now let's talk about actually adding items to a list unlike a string lists are mutable meaning I can say my list grab the item at index 0 and set it equal to something totally different so let's say new item here and let me print out my list and let's print it out before so we'll say before reassignment and then print my list whoops not as a string as the variable itself and then we will print after reassignment save this run the code and here I can see before reassignment I have a b c d e and then with line code number five with this reassignment I have new item b c d e and that just puts the point forward that we can actually do reassignments with index calls on a list defining it as a mutable item okay now let's talk about some basic list methods that you may find useful if you want to add a new item and have it be appended to the very end of a list all you have to do is use the append call so I can say my list and you can see the very first one here is append so we can select that and then you can append any item to the list so I can say something like new item and this will not affect any current item in the list it will just append it to the very end of the list so now let's print my list after we append it so I'm going to save run this again and here I can see my list was now a b c d e and then new item was appended to the very end of it if I end up appending a list to this so let's say I have a list that says X Y and Z just to make this clear note my brackets here so I'm actually appending a new list to the end of this what's going to happen is that now this very last item completely is a list if you actually want this list to be a part of the original what you have to do is not use append but use the extend method and then we can let's just actually put this to a new variable so we'll say list2 is equal to that list and I'm going to instead of appending something I will extend it save this so note the difference here this was with append that means the very last item is the list so I have a list nested inside of another list if I use extend instead and then print out the list then I actually extend the list to include these all these items right here so note the bracket difference between append and extend and you only use extend when you want to extend another list with the original list so we've talked about adding things to a list but what if you actually want to remove something from a list well the most common method for removing something from a list is the pop method so I can say my list dot pop and basically what this does is it grabs the very last item from a list and returns it so we'll call this item and then say print my list and print item so what's going to happen here when I run this is my original list was a b c d e then I popped off the very last item in the list saved it to the variable item and then when I print out my list e is now gone and item is now that letter e if you do not want to grab from the very end of a list you can actually specify an index position in pop so this can be any integer index position 
as long as it's in the list. So if I put zero here, now it's going to pop off index zero, which is A. So let me run this again. And now I see B, C, D, E, and I have A as my item. And that's the pop method. And keep in mind, pop method returns an item. Two more useful methods that you may find yourself using are reverse and sort. So if I say my list, reverse, close parentheses, and then actually print out my list, then I will get a reversed version of the list, E, D, C, B, A. And something that's interesting to note here is that this occurs in place. And what I mean by in place is I didn't have to save this to another item to see the change effect. All I had to say was my list .reverse, and my list was changed in place permanently. So then when I reprinted my list, it ended up being in reverse down here. So that's reverse. And then let's create a list here with a bunch of numbers in it, some random numbers. And instead of reverse, what I'm going to do is ask for sort. And if I save that and run this, it will actually end up sorting that list. So Python has its own rules for sorting things, especially if you have multiple data types in there, like strings and numbers. It has a specific hierarchy, and you can check out the Python documentation if you find yourself needing to know that hierarchy. But for the rest of this course, we won't be dealing with sorting mixed data type lists. And it's actually bad practice to do that because it's unusual to have to do that operation. You should try to have only one sort of data type for a single list. Okay. Finally, I want to mention two more topics, which is a nested list index and then a list comprehension. And we'll cover list comprehensions in much more detail later on, but I want you to be aware of them now since they may be confusing to beginners. But if I have a nested list, so we'll say my list is one, two, and then the third item in the list is going to be x, y, z. If I call print my list and I'm looking for the third item, so at index two, what's going to happen when I print this is I get this entire list back. So if I run this right now, I get X, Y, and Z. Imagine that I'm only looking for the letter Y. All I have to do here is add another set of brackets to actually index this list that was returned to me. And Y is at index one. So I just put the number one here, save it, run this again, and now I get the letter Y returned to me. And that's how you can index a nested list. And you can do this with a nest within a nest within a nest. That's not too common. You usually only have to do two levels at most. But keep in mind, this could keep going over and over again, depending how many lists you had nested inside of another list. So that's nested list indexing. And finally, I want to show you list comprehensions. So to do this, I'm going to create a list called matrix, which is going to be a nested list. So this will be one, two, three as the first item, four, five, six as the second item, and then seven, eight, nine. So right now I have three lists inside of a single list. So there's only three items in matrix, but each item is three more items in the list, which means I can do something like matrix zero, zero, and that counts as one. So it's the very first item here and the very first item of that item. Now for a list comprehension, it's basically going to be like a for loop, but flattened out into a list. So if I want the very first column, what I could do is say row zero for row in matrix. And we'll be covering list comprehensions and for loops in a lot more detail later on, but I just want to show what's possible with Python and how you can make really clean looking Python code. So then I'm going to print first call, save this, run this Python list, and now I see I have one, four, seven. So what is actually going on here? Well, I'm saying for row in matrix, and row counts as each item in the list. So it's saying for this one, this one, and this one, grab the very first element. So grab with bracket index location, element zero. So then it returns one, four, and seven. So this is a for loop, basically flattened out into a list, and it's inside brackets, so it ends up returning a list itself. And this is known as list, comprehension. And we're going to be covering this a lot more, but this is definitely something you're going to see all the time with Python. It's a great tool. And as you begin to get more advanced with Python, you yourself will be using it a lot.
All right, that's all we need to know about Python lists for now. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part four, dictionaries. Dictionaries are Python's version of hash tables, and back when we were working with JavaScript, these were known as objects. And again, they allow us to create a mapping of key value pairs. And something to really note about dictionaries is that they do not retain any order. They only have a key value pair system. Let's get started learning about the most important aspects of Python dictionaries. Let's hop to the editor now. Okay, let's start learning about dictionaries. First, I'll create a variable called my stuff, and we can have curly brackets, which defines a dictionary, and then we'll have a key. We'll make one key one, and then we have a colon separating its value. For instance, we'll have just value, and then a comma separating the next key value pair. So again, we'll have a string here, key two, colon, and then value two. And if we want to actually grab a value, you just call it by its key. So I will print my stuff, and then in square brackets, pass in the key I want. So let's say key one, save this, and I will say Python, and I've called this script notes.py, hit enter, and I get back value. And if I switch this to key two, save this, run this again, I get value two. Again, very similar to how objects worked in JavaScript. And it's important to note that dictionaries are very flexible in the data types they can hold. So for instance, this could have been a number, this could have been a string, I could have created another key called key three, and that could have had another dictionary inside of it with another key, one, two, three, and a list of items here. So this is totally uh, doable with Python. And if I just say print my stuff, we can save this, run this, and here we have the entire dictionary. Now notice here that the dictionary was not printed out in the same order that I defined it up here. So again, note dictionaries do not retain any sort of order. But let's imagine that I wanted to grab a particular item from this nested dictionary inside of a list. I'll call this grab me. So I want to grab this string called grab me. How do I actually get it from my stuff? Well, the first thing I need to do is work from the outside in. So, or from the inside out, excuse me. We see here that we are the third item in the list, meaning I'm at index two. So I can start getting that in the brackets. Then I'm at this key, one, two, three. So we'll have that as well, one, two, three, that string. And then that is with this key, key three. And then finally, that whole thing belongs to the dictionary called my stuff. So if I add this, these layers, first go to key three, then grab key one, two, three, then grab at index two. Let's save this, run it and I see I have the string grab me. Okay, so that's just a little practice exercise for you to check out. And what I could do is keep calling stuff off of this. So let's say I called upper off of that, run this, and now I see grab me in all caps. Hopefully you will never see something this nested, but keep in mind that Python does make it possible and pretty straightforward, honestly. Now let's talk about how to reassign dictionary items. Let me redefine my stuff to be something like lunch, and we'll define that as the string pizza, and let's define BFAST for breakfast as the string eggs. So I will save that, call my stuff, and if I call lunch, let's print this out. So print out my lunch, I should get back pizza when I run this script. So there's pizza. If I ever want to change a key value pair, what I can do is say the name of the dictionary, my stuff, call the key. In this case, it's lunch and then set it equal to something new. So for instance, let's say I had a burger for lunch. We'll save that. And now when I run this, I get burger out. And that is changed permanently in this dictionary. If I want to add a new key, then all I have to do is say my stuff, put a new key here, and we can say something like dinner, and then define that to be, what I have for, let's say I had a pasta for dinner, save that, run this, and now I have burger, let's define print my stuff, save that, so print the entire dictionary, and see here that I printed out burger, but now I had beef fast eggs, 
lunch, got redefined to burger, and then I had dinner for pasta, or pasta for dinner. Okay, that's really all we need to know about dictionaries. They should feel very familiar, given that you've already done objects with JavaScript. One thing that's different with between objects and JavaScript and dictionaries in Python is you don't really have the ability to add methods to dictionaries. Instead, they are just key value pairs, just straight hash tables. You won't be using them for methods inside of the dictionary like we did with objects in JavaScript. To do that with Python, we'll have to learn about object-oriented programming, which we'll discuss later on in the course. Okay, thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part five, tuples, sets, and booleans. Tuple sets and booleans are going to be the last data types or da basic data structures for Python that we're going to be covering. So we'll just cover them briefly and explain what they are. Tuples are immutable sequences, meaning they kind of act like a list, except you can't index something from a tuple and then try to change it. It's immutable. Sets are unordered collections of unique elements. And booleans, just like before, are true and false statements. Let's get started by going to the editor and showing you some quick examples of tuples, sets, and booleans. All right, let's first just show Booleans in Python. Booleans in Python are true with a capital T and false with a capital F. And as a quick note, you can also use zero and one if in control flow statements, but it's more common to see true and false than just a pure zero or one. But sometimes the situation makes more sense to use a numerical Boolean value versus true and false. Okay, that's basically it for Booleans. If you want to learn more about them, you can go back to the JavaScript section where we explain how to actually use Booleans more clearly. As far as the syntax though, it's just a capital T and capital F when dealing with Booleans. Now tuples are immutable sequences, so let's cover them real quickly. You construct a tuple just like you would a list, except instead of using square brackets, you use parentheses. And then you create a sequence, so there's a tuple, one, two, three and you can index out of a tuple using the bracket notation like you did for a list. So if I want the very first item in a tuple, that would just be index zero. So let's show this. I'm going to say Python, and this file is notes.py, and here I get one out since that was printing t of zero. Tuples can also hold mixed data types just like a list. So I could say t is equal to a, true and 123, save that, say print t, save it, python notes that pi, that's totally fine. So tuples, again, it basically like a list, except the main difference is that they're immutable. So if I try to say t of zero is equal to something new, and I run this, I'm going to get an error. And notice it says tuple object does not support item assignment. And that was actually the same error we got when we try to do the same thing with a string. So both a string and a tuple are immutable. A list, however, is mutable. So let's change these to be a list by just changing out the brackets. And now if I try this, and let's, instead of calling it t, we'll call it my list, my list, and then finally over here, my list. If I run this again, now a, true, and one, two, three are totally fine. I successfully ran that, so let's actually print it out to make sure. Save it, run it, and here I can see that a list is mutable, but a tuple is not. Now that's basically all you need to know about a list. Slicing, indexing, it's all exactly the same between a list and a tuple. So let's delete that, and now finally let's discuss sets. So sets are unordered collections of unique elements. And we can construct a set by calling the set keyword. I can say set, or x is equal to set, close parentheses. And then if I want to add something to the set, I can use the add method. And you can see here the list of methods available. But I will say add one to the set. And then I will add two to the set. And then I'm going to print the set. So let's save this and see what happens. So here I have my set one and two. Note how it has the curly brackets. So it looks very similar to a dictionary, except there aren't key value pairs here. It's just a bunch of elements. And remember for a set, the elements are unordered. So it has no particular order. If I print out X another time, it may come out another way. So let's add some more elements to a set. 
such as 4, and let's uh, do 0 0.1. Whoops, I need to add that. Save this, run this again, 0 0.1, 1, 2, and 4. So notice that it's coming out in a different way than I had actually imported. And don't be fooled that they come out sorted. That's not exactly how the set is uh, putting them in. So it doesn't send them out in any sort of sorting order. It's always an unordered collection of elements, unique elements. So let's focus on that unique aspect. So what does it actually mean by unique? Well, I'm going to try adding the similar elements multiple times. So I will try to add four again and say x add four again. Now a set, when you run this, is only going to put out one, two, and four, even though I added four three separate times. The reason for that is because it only takes in unique elements. So once an element is in the set, that's it. You can't keep adding it multiple times. It's only unique elements, which makes a set call really convenient to call on a list of multiple elements. So if I have a list with repeated elements like this one, so I see the brackets here, this inside is a list, and I do a set call on that list, and let's uh, print it out. So now I'm going to save this as, let's call it converted, because I'm converting a list into a set, and then I'm going to say print out converted, we'll save this, and then run this, and now I can see I get one, two, four, that was X, and converted, I got this whole list with multiple elements to just be one, two, three. Okay, that's really all we need to know now about Booleans, sets, and tuples. Later on when we cover for loops, we'll talk about tuple and packing a little bit, which is really common with Python. Sets, we won't be seeing them too much throughout the course. Booleans, we'll see those all the time. So keep those in mind as we continue on through the course. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part six exercise review. You've learned about the basic data types and data structures in Python, and now it's time to put your new skills to the test. The part six underscore exercise underscore review dot pi file has commented tasks for you to complete. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at it. You can find this file under the Python level one folder. It's just five simple problems. So let's take a quick look. Okay, this is what the file looks like, part six exercise review. And problem one just says this, given the string s is equal to Django, you wanna use indexing to print out the following, the d, the o, djan, just jan, and then just go. So again, use string indexing to print out these one, two, three, four, five different portions of the string. And then as a bonus question, you can use indexing to reverse the string. You may wanna review the notes because we didn't actually show that in the lecture video. Okay, problem number two, Given this nested list right here, this is L equals three, seven, then there's a nested list inside of it. I want you to reassign hello to be goodbye. Problem three, using keys and indexing, grab hello from the following dictionaries. So here we have three simple dictionaries, but you can see as they go on, they get more and more nested. So what you need to do is grab hello from D1, dictionary one, D2, dictionary two, and then D3. And remember, there's also lists in D3. So you have dictionaries inside of a list, inside of a dictionary, inside of a list, et cetera. So this one's quite tricky. So take your time with D3. See if you can work layer by layer. Problem four says to use a set to find the unique values of the list below. Uh, hopefully you're able to do that. We kind of just did that in the last lecture. So maybe review that if you're stuck on problem four. And then problem five, uh, it says you're given two variables, age is equal to this integer four, name is equal to Sammy. I want you to use print formatting to print the following string. Hello, my dog's name is Sammy and he is four years old. So again, review the dot format method of what's known as string interpolation or inputting these two as strings inside of this string. Okay, thanks everyone. And I will see you at the next lecture where we're going to be going over the solutions. Hello everyone, and welcome to the solutions lecture for the part six exercise review. Let's get started by hopping over to the editor. All right, here we are. Let's start off with problem one, where we were given the string Django and we had to do several indexing tasks. And if you ever wanna just reference the written out solutions, you can just use the part six exercise review solutions.py file, which has the solutions written out inside of it. 
Okay, so to get D, hopefully that was an easy one for you, but all I have to do is say S, the string, and then type zero to get the first element. To get the last element, there's two ways of doing this. The easier way is just to say negative one to get the very last element of any string, or you can just count over zero, one, two, three, four, five, and use five. For D, J, A, N, what you have to do is say, start from the beginning with a colon, and then go up to, but not including, the fourth indexed element. Then for Jan, what you have to do here is say, start at one, and then go up to, but not including, the fourth indexed element. For G, O, what you have to do is say, S, and then start at four, go all the way to the end of O. Then bonus, using indexing to reverse the string. This one, it says, start at the beginning, go all the way to the end, and the step size is negative one. In our course, we saw earlier how we could do step size of one, step size of two. Well, Python also supports a step size of negative one, meaning it will reverse the string when you print that out. Okay, problem number two. We wanted here to reassign hello to be goodbye. This is just an indexing call to grab the nested list. So the nested list inside of it is at index two, and then hello itself is at index two. And then to reassign it to be goodbye, we just have to say equals goodbye. And that's the solution for problem two. Moving along to problem three, we had three problems or sub problems here. We had to use keys and in indexing to grab hello from the, these following dictionaries. So dictionary number one, that one's pretty simple. I just say simple key. Whoops, if I can manage to grab it, okay. And that's all you had to do. For dictionary number two, it's a nested dictionary. So what you have to do is say K1. And then on top of that, once it returns that dictionary, you say K2. And then dictionary three, this one's definitely a lot harder than the rest of them. What you have to do is several layers. First, you need to grab the K1 key. Then you need to grab the first element in that list. Note here that this is a bracket, so this whole thing is a list, so we're grabbing the first item in that list. And then off of that, we need to grab the nest key, dictionary. And then off of that, we get this list, so I wanna grab the second item in that list, that index one, and then I wanna grab zero. If I don't have this additional zero, it would just return a list of one item. If I just want the actual string, then I have this extra zero here. Okay, let's move on to problem four, where we wanted to use a set to find the unique values of the list below. This was really easy. We did pretty much this exact example during the set lecture, where you just say set my list, and that's all you had to do for that. Then you are given two variables, age is equal to four, name is equal to Sammy. We wanted to use print formatting to print this thing out. So let's show that. I can say print and then hello my dog's name is and then we'll have brackets here let's make this a and then we'll say and he is brackets years old and then we want to say outside of this dot format and that for, dot format call is going to have a equal to the variable age, and then B equal to the variable name. And I need to put in B here. Now, you could have also done this without the variable calls. So you could have not had A, not had B, and then just not assigned A, not assigned B here. But I always recommend you do an assignment. That way, if you ever want to change order, you can do that easily. But that's all you had to do for this particular question. And then just make sure your parentheses are balanced here. All right, if you have any questions on the solutions, feel free to post to the Q&A. Hopefully this was a pretty straightforward assignment for you. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part seven, control flow. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the Python syntax for control flow. And this will include operators, if, else, if, and else statements, and loops, like for loops and while loops. We won't cover the main principles behind these topics. Hopefully you already remember them from the JavaScript lectures. We'll just cover the general syntax and what makes Python a little bit different than the programming languages for some of these control flow operators. Okay, let's get started. All right, so let's begin our discussion with comparison operators and logical operators. And I've copied and pasted here from the notes 
because we won't need to code that much. A lot of it's pretty straightforward. So for greater than, you just use the greater sign or greater than sign. Less than is the less than sign. You have greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, and then for equality, it's a little different than it was for JavaScript. So there is no triple equal sign in Python because Python will automatically check for types to be different or the same. So let me show you an example of what I mean by that. So here I'm going to say one equals equals one and it says true, but if I say one equals equals and then I pass in a string one, I get false. So there is no type coercion in Python like there was in JavaScript. So if I say hi is equal to by, then this is a really clear case where it should be false. Okay, so again, for Python, it's just gonna be two sets of equal sign. And for inequality, it's just an exclamation mark. So we can say one not equal to one, that's false. One not equal to the string, one, that is true. Now let's discuss logical operators of Python. I think this is one of the coolest parts about Python. The logical operators are just the literally the words and and or. So that makes reading logical operators of Python really simple, even if you haven't programmed before. There's no ampersand or pipe operators here. So again, it's just the keyword and, and then the keyword or. And you can have multiple logical operators like this, or, and or. Now let's move on to discuss if, elif, and else statements, or else if statements. And before we begin to talk about that, something to note with Python that's going to differentiate itself from other languages is that indentation is extremely important in Python. And it's basically Python's way of getting rid of enclosing brackets. So in a lot of other languages, you're gonna be using enclosing brackets a lot, as we saw with JavaScript. These don't really occur in Python. The reason for that is because Python really stresses readability due to white space and that white space comes from indentation. So let me show you some examples of if, elif, and else statements. If I want to have an if statement, and let's actually quit Python here, so then I can run this code. I will clear my screen. And then what I'm going to do is say if one is less than two, and then a colon indicates the code block. And I hit enter here, note that it automatically indents for me. And if you're working with any IDE that recognizes Python files, it should automatically indent for you. And then I'm going to say print yes. So now if I run this, I will say Python notes.py, hit enter, and I get a yes output. So the main features here, we can zoom in a little more just to make this really clear, is for any control flow statement with Python, you have the keyword operator here. It's if we'll see else and for loops, etc. You don't need to worry about parentheses here. You just type in whatever you want to actually compare or whatever the Boolean operator is. Then a colon here indicates that you're going to start a new code block. And then the code block itself is indented and everything that's indented at the same level belongs to the same code block. So if I want to have a nested if statement, so for instance, if two is less than three, print true. So let's save this and let's zoom back out a little bit so this isn't so massively zoomed in. And then let's actually run this and we get true. So now let's make one of these false. So I'm going to say if 20 is less than three, and then I'm going to print first block here, and let's change this to say second block. So note what's gonna happen here. First off, in order to run anything that's indented past line one, this has to be true. One has to be less than two. So then we go along and we see print first block, so that is true. Then it goes to line three. If 20 is less than three, that's not true, so nothing is going to occur, and line four won't execute. So now if I run this, I get first block only. So again, hopefully you can begin to see how the indentation works here. And this block of code is all indented at the same level, so it runs together. And then this block of code is indented in, so this is the top level for this block of code. So again, it's just a colon and indentation. Okay, so that's the basics of an if statement. Let's see an if else statement. 
I can say something like if 1 is less than 2, print hello. And then if I want an else to be attached to this if statement, all I have to do is line it up. So then I will say else colon print last, let's just say last, save. So then run the notes here and I get hello to print. Now let's change this so that is one greater than two, which is not true. So if I run this, then I get last. Again, main idea here is you have a colon instead of the curly brackets and the parentheses from other programming languages. And then finally, if you want to add more conditional checks, like an else if in JavaScript, you just use the single phrase elif, which is short for else if. So I can do something like this elif and then some condition here so elif 3 equals 3 print elif ran we save this and now when I run Python notes it says elif ran and that's because this first condition wasn't true and this elif condition was true so note what's happening here these are all lined up together on their indentation so if I have something, let's say, if one is equal to one, colon, I could grab all of this and then hit tab. And now these are all lined up with each other. So note here how indentation is really making it clear which code blocks belong to which conditional checks. All right, so that's the very basics of if, elif, and else statements with Python. Again, really wanna point out here the white space, and the colon is what's defining code blocks instead of like normal programming languages where you have parentheses and brackets. And this really emphasizes how fast you can code with Python, how readable Python is, and how much time you're gonna save working with Python versus other languages. Okay, so now let's go ahead and move on to a big topic, which is loops. We've already covered uh, loops in JavaScript, so we won't define here um, the general principles behind loops will just show you the syntax for working with them with Python. So first off are for loops. And for loops are going to behave a little differently depending on what you're working with in Python. So usually you're going to be using a for loop with a sequence and a sequence can be something like a list. So let's create a sequence. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the for loop syntax for Python looks like this. You say for some item in the sequence colon and then whatever you do is uh, code here so then let's just say print that item so hopefully this looks a little familiar from the for of or for in loops in javascript and then if i run this here i get one two three four five six so you can see i kept printing it every line or what i could also do is say print hello so if i save that and run this I get hello, hello, hello for each item in the sequence. And I can call this whatever I want. It doesn't have to be item. So I always make this really obvious by saying something like jelly, and then I'm going to print jelly every time, save that, run this, and I get back all the numbers in that sequence. Okay, hopefully that's pretty clear. It's just for, and then whatever variable you want in the sequence, and then you do some action for each of those variables. Okay, so that's how you iterate through a list. If you end up calling a for loop on a dictionary, so let's make that. Let's say D is equal to Sam one, and let's say Frank is two, and Dan is three. If I say for item in D, and say print item, if I save that, and then see what this looks like, it ends up printing out the keys, Sam, Dan, and Frank. But notice, it's not, it's not printing them out in order, and remember that's because dictionaries don't retain any sort of order. So if you're ever going to use a for loop with a dictionary, don't count on it happening in order. If you actually wanted to get the keys out, what you should do is something like this. You can say 4K, in D, since we are just printing out keys, we can say print the key and then print 
D of key. And this is how you can print out, if I run this, what, Dan is three, Frank is two, Sam is one. Again, order's not ever gonna be the same when you're going through a dictionary. There are also methods you can call off a dictionary um, for to get all the items or all the keys. So I could say dot values to get all the values, dot keys to get all the keys, etc. But we won't actually cover those right now. If we ever use them in Django, I'll be sure to clarify what we're doing there. But again, dictionary with for loops, it's automatically going to be the keys. All right, let's delete that. And now let's talk about iterating through a tuple and about tuple unpacking. So a lot of times built-in functions in Python are going to end up giving you structures that look like this. It'll be a list and inside of that list you'll have tuples that look like this. So one, two, five, six. So what do I have here? I have a list of three tuples. So if I say for item in my pairs, print item. I'm going to save this, run it. I get each tuple out, one, two, three, four, five, six. But what I can also do, and this is a special case, is if I have a sequence that consists of tuples, I can do what is known as tuple unpacking of Python. So I can kind of type a tuple here and say something like tuple one, tuple two. And then I'm going to print tup1, and then I will print tup2. So if I save that, basically what happens here is I'm unpacking that tuple in my for loop. So I run this, and I can get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Or if I switch out the order here, I should get 2, 1, 4, 3, 6, 5. So let's do that. Save it. Run this, and I get two, one, four, three, six, five, because note it's printing out the second item in the tuple and then the first item in the tuple. So that is tuple unpacking, and you usually don't see it with these parentheses. You usually see it just like this. So if you ever see something like this, don't be confused uh, or intimidated. It's just tuple unpacking, and this sort of formatting is really commonly used in Python, so tuple unpacking is definitely something we'll be working with in the future. Okay, so that's really all you need to know about for loops. Let's quickly discuss while loops with Python. So I'm going to delete this. So while loops, again, allow us to continually perform an action until a condition becomes true. And it's really simple. I'll show you a quick example. We'll say i is equal to one. And then we will say while i is less than five, then colon, that indicates the code block, we'll say print i is and then we'll use print formatting here, pass an i, and then we will say i is equal to i plus one. So again, really simple example. Let's clear this. If I run Python notes again, it says i is one, i is two, i is three, i is four, and then once i is equal to five, it's no longer less than five, so the while loop breaks. So it's just a colon and white space indicating the loop. Now let's quickly discuss a few more uh, useful topics to know since we're talking about control flow. One of them is the range function and range functions can quickly generate integers for you based on a starting point and an ending point. So if I do something like, well, let's actually show this with Python over here directly in the command prompt. So if I do something like one, two, three, four, five, I have a list that goes from one all the way to five. But I can use range to help me out. In Python 3, if I just type range five, I get back this range zero to five object. What I have to do is say list range zero five, and then I actually get back a list, zero, one, two, three, four, where the first parameter in range is the starting index position, and the second one is the end index position. And I can add a third argument indicating a step size. So I can say list range, and let's go from zero, 20, and then I'm gonna type in two. I hit enter, and I get all the even numbers that go up to, but not including, index 20. And try to remember back to slice notation. Sometimes students are confused. They expect a 20 to show up here, 
but it's not including 20. So if we wanted 20, we would have to say 21. We'd have to say one greater there. All right, now another question you might be thinking is, well, what is range 0, 0,5? What is that and why did it return that? That is a generator, and basically what that means is it's going to generate the items or elements in this list instead of saving it all to a list. And that saves your computer memory. So instead of having to store this entire huge list in memory, because let's say you had range and then some humongous number, you wouldn't want your computer to have to save this entire list if you're just going to iterate through it. What you want is just a generator where it remembers the previous number and then adds one and then saves that previous number, adds one, saves it, and it keeps deleting so it only has one number in memory at a time. And it knows the formula to get to the next number. So for instance, it would say, I remember two, I add two to it to get four, get rid of two, now my current number is four. Oh, you want the next number, add two to it, now I have six, get rid of four for memory. And that way we go along just remembering one number. And that's kind of the idea behind a generator. So you can actually then use something like for item in range. And usually you see something like 10 print item. We'll save that. And then let's quit Python here. Call Python notes.py. And here I can see I'm getting 0, 1, 2, 3 all the way up to nine. So it doesn't include 10. Remember, it only goes up to nine here. Okay, now let's quickly recover list comprehension. We mentioned it before, but let's show you a more practical example now. Imagine I have the list x is equal to one, two, three, four, and I wanna create a list of those items squared. I could make an empty output list, just with empty brackets there, and say for num in x, so in my list x, take out, and then append num to the power of two. And then say print the output. And note that the print out is lined up with four, meaning it's going to occur after this entire for loop has been ran. So I will save this, run python notes.py, and here I can see I get one, four, nine, 16. So that's how you would do this with a normal for loop. But if you ever find yourself running a for loop like this and always appending something to a list, from another sequence or another list, the way you can do this is write this as a list comprehension. And what you do is you essentially break down this for loop. So we take the original x here, and it says for num in x, we change this out, we get rid of it completely, change it here, make this into a bracket, and then make what we have on the append go in front of the for. And that is the basics of a list comprehension. It's just a for loop rewritten in a flattened form. And then we can say, call this whole thing out. Whoops. And then let's print it. We'll say print out, save it, run this, and we get 14916. And those are the basics of a list comprehension. Okay, that was control flow of Python. If you have any questions, feel free to post to the Q&A forums. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Welcome to part eight, functions. Functions in Python use the DEF or DEF keyword, as in you're defining a function. We will also talk a bit more about some useful methods for various Python objects, which will behave basically as functions you can call off of the object. Let's get started by hopping over to our editor. All right, so remember that a function formally is a useful device that groups together a set of statements so that they can be run more than once. And it can also let us specify parameters that can serve as inputs to the function. But on a more fundamental level, they basically allow us to not have to repeatedly write the same code over and over and over again. So what we're going to do is start with the DEF keyword. And you can actually just hit enter here, DEF. And then you can have the name of your function. And Python uses camel case. So, or excuse me, snake case for function names, unlike JavaScript, which uses camel case. So if you want your function, you say my underscore f-u-n-c or whatever you want your function name to be, but with the words separated out with an underscore. And then if you want a parameter, you can have something that looks like this, param one. If you want a default value for it, you can say equals to, and then input some default value. Then you can put in a colon here, 
And you see now we have an indented block and anything inside of this belongs to the function. It belongs to the scope of that function. And then I can say something like print my first Python function. We will save this. Note that if I run the script, we shouldn't expect anything to happen, which nothing does happen because I've only defined the function. If I actually want to call it later on in my code, I say my func close parentheses. And here we have my first Python function. Great. If I wanted to use the parameter there, I could have also said something like dot format param1, save it, and then let's include that over here. Save that, run this, and we see, whoops, forgot to actually call it, my func, rerun, and here it says my first Python function, and then default, whatever the default value for that parameter was. If we want our function to have a doc string, and that's just a documentation string, you type a set of three quotes, usually they're double quotes, but it can work for single quotes as well, and then another set, and then anything inside here, this is the doc string. So you probably noticed, as we were typing in methods and functions, if we ever saw the help here, len for instance, which was the length function, you get a little output here that says it returns the number of items of a sequence or of a collection. Now, we might be wondering, how do I actually get that information? How do I know what this function does? Well, that is the doc string. So now let's try it with our own function. I'm going to save this, and then let's say my underscore func. You should notice now, this is the doc string displaying here. And Python basically will go over to the function, check if there's a doc string immediately below as a multi-line comment, and you can do a multi-line comment with these sets of three quotes, meaning anything inside these sets of three quotes is part of the comment. So now again, if I check my func here, I see this is the doc string and then these various lines that I wrote. So keep that in mind. It's always good to document your functions, especially if you're going to be using them a lot or especially if someone else is going to be reading your code. It's just the right thing to do. Now let's quickly go over the difference between printing something in the function and the return keyword of a function. So let's make a quick example, a classic hello function. And then we'll say print, and it just prints hello. We save that. If we want to call it, whoops, if we want to call it later on in our code, all we have to do is make sure you're lined up outside of the scope of the function. Call hello. We'll save this, run this code, and here I have hello. So again, indentation is very important. Make sure you didn't accidentally do something like this while you're coding. Now, that's the first example. Let's go on to example two, which will, instead of just printing the hello, it's going to return hello. So we'll get rid of these parentheses and just say return the string hello. So now if I call hello and I run this, I don't get anything out. And that's because it was just returning hello. It wasn't actually printing it. So I can say something like result is equal to hello being called, and then I can print out that result. We'll save this, run the code, and now I see I get hello as the output. And this is the way you're going to see most functions work. It will actually return an object for you to save as a variable and use later on. Now a quick note, again, if you're coming to Python from a different language that is not dynamic programming, uh, you may have to be careful when you're defining a function as far as what inputs you expect. So let's imagine I create a function that adds two numbers together, and hopefully this example looks a little familiar to you, and it takes in num1, num2, colon, and then it returns num1 plus num2. What you probably expect your user to do is something like this. Result is equal to add num, and then let's say two and three. And then if I print out my results, save it, we run this and I get five. But Python will work for a lot of things. So if I actually input two strings here, or let's say even worse, for some reason my inputs were strings instead of being numbers, we can save that, run this, and now it outputs 23 instead of five. So this is kind of a more realistic error you might get in your code. Let's say you asked for a form input with Django 
and it returned it back as a string and you were expecting a number, uh, this kind of error could easily occur. So you, what you may want to do is actually check for types. And you can check for a Python type using the type keyword. So if you say something like print type of result, I will save this. Let's run it. I get its class str, which means it's part of the string class. And then if I make these back into integers, save this and run this again, I get class int. So sometimes you'll probably want to have a check that says something like this. If type of num1 is equal to type of num2 is equal to type of 10, and then we'll have the colon here, return num1 plus num2. And then we'll say else return, sorry, I need integers. So now let's see how this works. If I save this and run just print results, save that, clear my console, run Python notes, I get five out. But now if I type in two and three, save that, run this, it says, sorry, I need integers. Again, this is a very simple way to test uh, if type inputs are correct. We'll discuss much more formal methods such as checking for actual exceptions and errors and doing unit testing later on in the course. For right now, just keep this in mind that you may get different types than you expected and that Python can still deal with them. Now let's briefly discuss what is known as a Lambda expression. And often you won't always need a full blown function like we've defined here. You may just want to use a function just one time, which means you didn't really need to define it more than that one time you used it. And in some of these cases, it makes more sense to use what is known as a Lambda expression. And it looks like this, Lambda expression. So to actually get the full idea of when we would use a Lambda expression, we need to use or introduce a function that accepts other functions as input parameters. So in this case, we'll introduce the filter function. So let's start by introducing how the filter function works, what it would look like with a normal function as set, accepted as the input, and then what it would look like with Lambda accepted as the input. So I will create my list and set it equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, And then I'm going to create a function called even bool. And let's do it in camel ca or snake casing. It accepts a number and then it says return num mod two equal to zero. So what does that actually mean? It means it's going to return true if the number is even or false if the number is odd. And then let's show you how you can use the filter function. The filter function takes in two arguments, and we can see them down here. It takes in a function and then a sequence. And what it does, it returns those items of sequence for which the function item is true. If the function is none, then it just returns the items that are true. So let's try this. I'm going to first pass in my function, which was even bool, and then I'm going to pass in my sequence, which is my list. And let's do save this as a result called evens, and then print out evens casted as a list. We will save this, clear the console, and then run python.notes.py. And then here I have two, four, six, eight. So I have now all the even numbers from this list. And this is again, just filtering out wherever even bool returned true on my list. And then we had to cast it as a list because if we didn't, we would otherwise get a little generator object. So if I save that and run this again, I get this thing that says filter object. And that's because like I mentioned for range, this is actually a generator and it won't actually create the list unless you specifically ask it to. All right, so now let's show you how we can do that with a Lambda expression. So a Lambda expression is basically a breakdown of this function 
or of any function really. So let's break down this function into a lambda expression. And a lambda expression is pretty much always on one line. So the first thing we need to do is take care of the input. So a lambda expression has no name, which is why it's also sometimes called an anonymous function. So I replace all that with just lambda num. So again, I replace def, the name of the function, and any inputs with just lambda, and then the input itself. And then we say colon, we get rid of this return keyword. And now we have our lambda expression. This is the lambda expression version of the even bool function we just made. So I will cut that out and then paste it here. And this is a typical use case for lambda. We don't actually want to define an entire function if we were only going to use it once inside of another function. And now let's actually run this and we see that it works the same way. And if we cast this as a list before we run this, add in the parentheses here, run it again. You can see here now I have two, four, six, eight. Great, so that is all working the same as it did before. So those are Lambda expressions. We'll see them later on in the course, so if you don't fully understand them yet, don't worry, we'll get plenty of more practice with them. Finally, I wanna show you just some useful methods that you may not be familiar with for all these various basic data types that we've learned about. So for a string, some nice methods that we've already discussed are dot lower, which lowercases everything, dot upper, which uppercases everything, and then split, which splits up on whatever you want to be a list. So let me show you a more realistic example of where you may encounter dot split. Let's say we're trying to make a Twitter clone. So I say tweet, and I say go sports, hashtag sports. And I'm only looking for things that are on the hashtag. If I know there's only one hashtag uh, somewhere in the actual tweet, then I can say split on hashtag. And later on, we'll have an entire section on regular expressions, which are going to allow us to do much better uh, searching through text than what I'm showing here. But let's do that. Let's say st.split, and I'm going to save this as result. And now let's run python notes.py, and whoops, this should be not st split, this should be tweet split. Save it, now run it again. And we don't get anything back because I didn't print out the result. Save it, run it, and here it says go sports, comma, sports. So I know sports here is the actual hashtag. So if I wanted just that, what was under the hashtag, then I could say one there, and I get out sports. And that's a way you would probably more realistically use the dot split method off of a string. Then I want to quickly mention the in operator. It's not a method, it's just something that's really useful. If you ever want to know if something is in a sequence, for example, if I want to know is x in the list one, two, three, all you have to do is use the keyword in to solve that. And this will return a Boolean. So I can print out the result of this entire thing run the code, and it says false. X is not in one, two, three. But now if I add X to this, save it, run it again, I get back true. Okay, there are a lot more examples of functions and various other things in the actual lecture notes. So check out part eight underscore functions.py for fully commented code with a lot more examples if you feel like you need more. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part 9 function exercises. Let's take a quick look at some of the function exercises that are here for you to answer. The relevant files are part 9 function exercises and part 9 function exercises solutions.py. Let's open them up in the editor and see what they're all about. Okay here we have part 9 function exercises open and complete the tasks below by writing functions. And keep in mind these problems are actually meant to be really tough even if you do know Python. It's all about breaking the problem down into smaller logical steps. And if you get stuck on this, don't feel bad about having to take a peek at the solutions file or at the solutions lecture. For the first problem, you'll be given a list of integers and I want you to return true if the sequence of numbers is one, two, three appears in the list somewhere. So for example, in this first one, here we have one, two, three in the center. So we return true. Here we don't have one, two, three. 
so we return false. Here we have one, two, three at the end, so we return true, and just fill out this array check uh, function. And here we're accidentally using camel casing, we should be using snake casing with Python, but don't worry about that too much, it'll still work either way. With problem two, given a string, we want to return a new string made of every other character starting with the first. So hello yields hlo. Again, some examples here. Hopefully you remember string slicing and indexing enough to make this an easy task for you. And now on to problem three. Problem three is given two strings, I want you to return true if either of the strings appears at the very end of the other string. And I want you to also ignore upper and lower case differences. So in other words, the computation should not be case sensitive. And a quick hint slash note, you can use s.lower to return the lowercase version of a string. So here we can see three examples that will yield true. I have high ABC and ABC. Note that ABC is at the end of the first string, so that returns true. Then I kind of have the opposite, ABC and high ABC. ABC is at the end of the second string here, so that also returns true. And then I have ABC and then ABX, ABC. It, ABC here appears at the end of this one, so that returns true. Again, it's if either string is at the end of the other string, you return true. Problem four is given a string, return a string where for every character in the original, there are two characters. So here we're kind of just doubling the characters in the string. So you can check out these examples to get an idea of what I mean. Then problem five is probably the most uh, difficult problem here, but basically just read this problem statement carefully and then check out the actual examples here. So this is kind of a longer read, but check it out. It's probably the trickier problem. There's two functions for it. Then problem six is a bit easier. It just says return the number of even integers in the given array. So this one should be uh, pretty straightforward. If you have a list or an array, uh, count how many even integers are inside of it. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture where we'll actually be programming through the solutions. Hello everyone, and welcome to part nine function exercises solutions lecture, where we're going to be going over the solutions for the previous function exercises. Let's go and open up the file to get started. Okay, here I am at the function exercises file. Let's start off with problem one which was remember, if we wanted to have a list of integers, we need to return true if the sequence of numbers one, two, three appears in the list somewhere. And basically for this one, what we're going to be doing is iterating through the list three at a time. So let's show you how we can do that with this array check function. I'm going to say for i in range, and then I'll go for the length of nums because I don't know how long nums is going to be as a list. And then I will say minus two, because I don't want to go all the way to the end, I just want to go starting from here. So I will go minus two back because I'm going to be counting in steps of three. So let me show you what that looks like. I will say if nums at index i is equal to one and nums of i plus one is equal to two and nums of i plus two is equal to three. Well, in that case, then I return true. If that never happens, meaning I never get a return true inside of that for loop, then I will just return false. And notice how this return false statement is in line with that for loop, which means this entire thing has to run through. And if we never get a return true here, then we never actually break out of this. And then we go to return false. Okay. So that's the basic idea. Again, length of nums minus two because I'm hopping over in steps of three. And if I went all the way to the end, I would get an error because I'd be indexing outside of the actual list. The last one I want to go to is right here, length of nums minus two in the C's back. That way I can do the plus one and plus two checks. All right, now let's go on to problem two, which was given a string, return a new string of every other character starting with the first. So hello yields HLO. Okay, now as a quick uh, moment, there's many, many ways you could do this. In fact, you could just use a slicing notation, but let me show you a really standard way to do this with just a loop. And this one will work across any language. We set an output to be result, and then I will say for i in range, length of the string, str, and actually str isn't a good choice here, 
So I will say my string and change this to be my string as an input. And then I will say if i mod 2 is equal to 0, result is equal to result plus my string at the current index, which is i. And then I'm just going to return the result. So this is a very basic um, algorithmic way of solving this problem. The other way you could do this is by actually using slice uh, notation by skipping every other letter. So it would be something like colon colon 2. So again here we're saying for i in range, the length of the string, if i mod 2 is equal to 0, meaning we're on even numbers, result is result plus my string. And this is kind of the same thing as just saying my string colon colon 2. Alright, now let's continue on to problem 3. Problem 3, we were given two strings and we wanted to return true if either of the strings appears at the very end of the other string. And we could ignore uh, case sensitivity here. So what we can do is, since we're ignoring case sensitivity, right away just make them both lowercase. So I will say a is equal to a.lower and b is equal to b.lower. And then I'm going to say return and there's two ways we could have done this. We could have used the special ends with method. Now we didn't actually cover the ends with method so you may not have been aware of it but it looks something like this. You can say b dot ends with a and or I should say or a ends with b. And that's the way you could do it with uh, the most Pythonistic code using that ends with method. But we'll pretend that you didn't know that since we didn't really cover it and show you the more algorithmic way of doing this. We will say return the string a minus, this is indexing, the length of b all the way to the end. And so what this basically is doing is it's asking does the string a minus length of b all the way to the end equal to b? Or is a equal to b minus length of a all the way to the end? So all we're doing here is we're checking does a equal to b with the ending part removed. And that basically tells you does it end with it. So take your time, this uh, syntax may look a little weird, but this is all we have to really do. Again, all we're doing here is we're saying for this, does the string b equal to the length of b all the way to the end with the negative indexing, which basically allows us to go backwards. And essentially what we're saying, if we look up here at this example, if I have the string abc and the string hi abc, I want to know, does the end of this string right here equal the end of this string? So I'm using the length of this string to check what's going on with the equal length over here, which is why we have a negative starting from the uh, backwards or starting from the last index position, I should say. All right, so take your time with this one. Uh, this one's a little smoother and this one's more algorithmic. Okay, now for problem four, we wanted to say, given a string, return a string where for every character in the original, there are now two characters. So what we can do for this is we'll create an output string called result, which is just an empty string. And then we'll say for character in my string. And what we're going to be doing here is taking the result, which is an empty string, and then adding to this string character times two. And then all we have to do is at the end of this return the result and that's how the double character can work. So all we're doing here is essentially continuously concatenating result with the double of the character. And then at problem five, what we wanted to do was given those three integer values, a, b, and c, return their sum, except for those special rules and why this was called the no teen sum. So we had also the option to create this helper function. 
So let's show you what we could have done here. So for this first one, this no teen sum, what you could have done was say return, and then we'll say fix teen A plus fix teen B plus fix teen C. Where what fix teen is, what it's actually doing is just a helper function. So in this way, we keep avoiding uh, writing repeated code. We practice the dry principle, don't repeat yourself. Again, let's focus on defining this helper function, fix teen, which really does most of the dirty work. So what we can do here is say if n is in 13, 14, 17, 18, or 19, that was the conditional list based off of the instructions, we want to return 0. And if that's not the case, then what we're going to be returning is the actual number n. So what this does is it calls fix teen on each of the three numbers. And what fix teen itself does, it checks if n is one of these numbers. And if it is, it just returns 0. Otherwise, it returns the number itself. And then what we do to actually call this is call no teen sum along with this fix teen. Otherwise, we'd have to write this code three separate times in no teen sum. All right, now on to problem six, the last problem. For this problem, we wanted to return the number of even integers in the given array. So this one's actually quite simple. So let's start off by making a variable called count, and we'll set it equal to zero. And then after that, we're going to say for the element in nums, or for every num in nums, we'll say if that particular element divided by two has a remainder of zero, meaning it's even. So when I say divided by two, I really mean remainder, I really mean the mod modulator. I'll say count gets another one. And then after all this, we're going to just say return the count. So again, all I'm doing here is I'm setting a count equal to zero going through the elements, if the element is even, meaning element mod two is equal to zero, add one to the count, and then just return the count. All right, that's it for this. If you have any questions, feel free to post to the Q&A forums, or just check out the solutions lecture, which has more code and some explanations. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part 10 simple game project. So we've learned enough Python for you to actually create a simple command line game to finish off Python level one. Let's discuss the rules of the game and then show you an example run through of a finished game. The computer will think of a three digit number that has no repeating digits like three, four, six, or seven, two, one. So again, no repeating digits and it's just a three digit number. Then you're going to enter at the command line an input of your own guess of what three digit number the computer is thinking of. Then the computer will give you back some clues, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Based off these clues, you're going to guess again, and you'll keep doing it until you actually break the code with a full match, three digits of your guess to the three digits that the computer originally guessed. So the possible clues are this. Based off your guess, the computer will say close if you've guessed the correct number, but in the wrong position. It will then also add a clue of match if you've guessed the correct number in the correct position, and then it will return nope if you haven't guessed any of the numbers correctly. So we can get multiple clues back, and that's possible. We'll show you now a quick run through of the game, but you're going to need to look up a few things on your own to complete the project. There are hints for you left in this particular file, part10simplegame.py. We haven't actually told you how to get input from a user, but the hint is in part10 simplegame.py. If you get stuck on anything though, feel free to post the Q&A forums. I'm always happy to help out or to check out the solutions.py or the solutions lecture. Okay, so let's see what this actually looks like. So here I've copied and pasted the solutions to the notes.py file I have open. So when I say Python notes.py, it'll say something like welcome code breaker. Let's see if you can guess my three digit number. The code has been generated. Please guess a three digit number. What is your guess? I'll guess something simple like four, five, six. Enter it and it says there is a match somewhere. So I know either four is in the correct position, five is in the correct position, or six is in the correct position. So I can swap some of them out to double check this. 
So let's say 4, 2, 3. And I get a match, so I'm going to guess that 4 is the first number. And let's confirm that by saying, for instance, 4, 7, 8. And now I get a match again, meaning 4 is definitely the first number. And then you just keep guessing the number over and over again until you have actually broken the code. Again, the three possible clues are nope, close, match, and you can get multiple clues based off your number's position. Thanks everyone. If you have any questions on this, feel free to post the Q&A forums, and I'll see you at the next lecture where I will code through an example solution. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Simple Game Project Solutions Lecture. We'll be finishing off Python Level 1 with this lecture, where we're going to be coding through the solutions for the game project. Let's get started. Okay, whenever we begin a project, it's always a good idea to map out the steps we need to take to actually complete the tasks. For one thing, I'm going to need to get the actual player guess. So that's one of the steps I need to do. The other thing I need to do is generate the computer code. That's the three digit number. Then I also want to generate the clues. So that's going to be comparing the guess to the computer code that I generate. And then what I want to do is actually have some sort of logic that runs the game. So we'll call this run game logic. Okay, let's get started with the simpler function of getting the guess. So what I'm going to do here is say def get underscore guess, and I won't take any actual parameters for this function. Instead, what I'm going to do is return the input of what is your guess. So let's actually here at the bottom where it says run game logic, test this out by saying get guess, and then I'm going to save this as some variable called x. And then let's say print x. I will save this and let's run this. So I will say python notes.py, hit enter, and I see I get function. So actually, whoops, forgot to call the function. And now let's run this. Okay, so it says, what is your guess? I'm going to input, let's say one, two, three, hit enter, and it types one, two, three out. Now let's check to see what type that is. I'm going to save this, run this again. I'll put one, two, three as my guess, and it says it's a string. So I can see here that any input is a string. Now you can definitely work with a string and you can index off a string. So I could say something like x0 and then do stuff with it. But a string is also immutable and I may want to play around with this object more. So I will cast it to a list after the input. Again, it's totally up to you. There's many ways you could have created this project, but I'll just do that for safekeeping. And now my get guess function is complete. The next step is to generate some computer code. So this is the three digit number that the computer is going to generate. And I'm going to say generate code. And then let's do it this way. I'm going to create an object called digits and I will use list comprehension to do it. Again, you could have just used a for loop here, but I will say string num for num in range 10. So here what I'm doing is I'm creating a list of every number from 0 to 9 and I'm going to cast it as a string. And then what I need to do is generate a code. So I will say this, shuffle this digit. So I'm going to shuffle the digits, then grab the first three after the shuffle. And this was given to you as a hint in the hint lecture. So I will say import random, and we'll talk about importing random and making your own modules later on. But this will allow you to say random dot shuffle. We can pass in our digits list. And then when I grab the first three, what I'm going to do here is say return digits, whoops, colon three. So I've created digits, shuffled them, and then returned the first three. So that should give me a random three digit code that is completely unique. So all the numbers are unique because I used range zero to nine. 
Next, I want to generate the clues. And this is probably the harder part, but with a little bit of logic and control flow, we should be able to manage it. I'm going to create a function called, let's just call it generate clues. And it will take in the code that the computer did and then the user guess. So the user is going to make some guess. So this again is going to take in a user guess and some code and then compare the numbers in a loop and it's going to create a list of clues according to the matching parameters. So first off, I'm going to say if the user guess is equal to the computer code, I'm just going to return code cracked because if the guess is the same as the computer code, well then we're all done here. So that's the very first thing I should check. Next, if that hasn't happened, I'm going to create a list, an empty list right now called clues, and I will keep adding to it as I go through the user guess. So something I can do here is use enumerate. And let me show you what enumerate actually does. I'm going to say for ind num in enumerate, and you don't have to use enumerate, but you can. Basically what it does is it allows you to, instead of having to do something like count equals zero, or to make this a more realistic sample, ind is equal to zero, and then come in here and say something like ind is equal to ind plus one. If I just want the actual index, I can use enumerate, which is going to enumerate starting at zero for me. And then I'm going to put in the user guess. And then I will say if num is equal to code ind, I'm going to append match. So what does this actually mean? Well, I'm going to, with enumerate, go through the user guess, and using tuple unpacking, I'm unpacking two things, the actual index location and then the number itself. And I'm saying if the number is equal to the code index location, so remember I'm going through user guess, so I'm saying if the current number and user guess is equal to the number of the code at that same index location, then I know I have a match. So I will append the word match to my list of clues. Then I'm going to say elif num is in code. So what does that mean? Well, I know the num is somewhere in the code. Then I will say clues dot append close. So I'm saying, hey, you didn't get a match, but you were pretty close. And pay attention to the ordering here. I'm saying if there's a match, then check that first. Then if the num is in the code, append close. I can't have this go the, in another order, so I can't check for close first. Otherwise, I would always uh, skip over match. So pay attention to the ordering here. It's kind of important for the specific case. Otherwise, if I didn't actually have a match or a close, what I'm going to do is start off with another if statement where I say if clues is empty. So after going for the for loop, if the clues is empty, then all I'm going to do is return a list of a single item that says nope. And then I will say else return clues. So what does this actually mean? Well, let's break it down. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit so we can see the entire function while we break it down. Okay, first off, I just wanna check if the user guess matches the code. If it does, I've cracked it and we're ready to go. Otherwise, what I'm going to do is define an empty list called clues. And then using this special enumerate function, I'm going to go through the index and numbers. Again, you could have done this without enumerate by just saying, index equals zero, and then adding to index for every iteration of this for loop. But this is kind of just a convenience function. Then I will say if the number at the user guess is equal to the code at this specific index location, then I'm going to append the word match. Else if the num is in the code, then I append close. And note the order here, I have to check for the match first before I check if it's close or not. Then, if I go through this entire for loop and clues is still empty, meaning there was no match or there was no close, I'm going to return nope. 
else I'll just return clues. Next, it's time to add in some game logic. So let's show you how we can do this. I'm going to print something like welcome code breaker and then I will generate a secret code. So I will make some variable called secret code and set it equal to generate code. Remember generate code returns the computer's code. So that's the secret code and then I'm going to also say make some variable called clue report and set that equal to an empty list. And let's try to follow snake casing here. And then I want to keep asking this until the code is cracked. So while clue report is not equal to the string code cracked and let's make sure that matches exactly up here. Okay, so while it's not this Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set my guess equal to get guess, close parentheses. And then what I want to do is say clue report is equal to generate clues of the user guess and the secret code. Then I'm going to print here's the result of your guess and actually say for clue inside the clue report print the clue. And this keeps going over and over and over again until I actually have a clue report that says code cracked. Because remember generate clues returns this string code cracked once I've actually gotten the correct code. So let's run this and see if we can actually play a game. I'm going to say python notes.py, hit enter. It looks like I have invalid syntax right now. So I say if clues equal to, whoops, that should be two equal signs. So let's check that. That's happening at line 29. Scroll back up, we'll say if clues double equal sign, save this. And you can always reference the core solution notes to get the actual correct code. Now I get Python notes.py. Perfect. Welcome, code breaker. What is your guess? I'm going to guess one, two, three. Hit enter. And here's the result of your guess. It says match match. So let's confirm this by typing something like five, six, seven. And we get close. So that's interesting. It means one of the extra numbers is one, five, six, or seven. So that means if I say eight, nine, zero, it should give me none or nope. Perfect. So it looks like my game's working so far. So now it's just time of guessing. Three, two, six, six, three, two, six, two, three. All right, looks like the code was cracked with six, two, three. Great. All right, so if you have any questions on how to do that project or what was going on, feel free to post to the Q&A forums and make sure you walk through the solutions code yourself. This is just one simple example of how you could have done this problem. There are many, many ways you could have done this project and you could have added more to it. It's really up to you how far you want it to go, but again, if you have any questions, feel free to post the Q&A forums. Thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to Python Level 2. In this section, we're going to be covering some more advanced topics that will really allow you to use Django with ease. Knowing these topics before you actually reach Django is going to make the transition to using Django very smooth, and you won't get hung up on some of the more complicated aspects of Django, such as object-oriented programming, using classes, or regular expressions. Okay, let's get started. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to Part 1, Scope. We've already discussed scope a bit in the past, specifically in the JavaScript section of the course, but Python's scope rules can sometimes confuse beginners. So let's quickly go over the key rules of Python's scope. Python's scope follows the LEGB rule, local enclosing function locals, global and built-in. And what this actually means is if you define a variable name somewhere in your code, and then later on in your code, you want to call that variable. Python needs to look in what's known as the namespace, which is basically where it knows what variable names go where. But sometimes it needs to follow rules to know what scope you're actually calling. 
And the order it goes in is it first looks for local variables, then it looks for enclosing function locals, then it looks for global variables, and then finally, if it still can't find that namespace, it goes to the built-in. So let's actually define these four topics a little more. So the local level are names assigned in any way within an actual function. And that includes a DEF function or a Lambda expression. And they're not declared global in that function, meaning they don't use some sort of global keyword call. Then we have the enclosed function locals, and that's names in the local scope of any and all enclosing functions, DEF or Lambda expressions from inner to outer. And that has to do with functions within other functions. Then we have the global level, and those are names assigned at the top level of a module file or declared global in a DEF within the file. And that again is either at the top level or using the global keyword. Then finally, if we still can't find that variable name, we look into the built-in level. And those are names pre-assigned in the built-in names module. Things such as open, the range function, a syntax error, or even things such as the len, which is the built-in length function. Okay. Let's actually walk through some simple examples to make Python's scope a lot more clear to you. Let's hop over to the editor now. Okay, to begin our discussion of scope, let's start off with a simple experiment. Imagine at the top of a file, I define x to be equal to 25. And then I'm going to create some function. We'll call it my func. It doesn't take any arguments or parameters, but what happens is it sets x equal to 50. And then what it will do, it's going to return x. So that's what it does. And then what I'm going to do outside of this is say print x. So take some time and think what the actual output is going to be when I run this file. So I will say python notes.py, hit enter, and I get out x is equal to 25, or just 25. Hopefully that makes sense to you because we haven't even run this function yet. All we've done is defined it. The only thing that x here on line 7 is aware of is the global x, which is up here on line 1. Now let's imagine this. We say print, and I call my func inside of that print statement. Now remember, this my function returns x after reassigning it to x is equal to 50. Now if I save this and run it, what do you expect to come out? Well, hopefully you expected 25 and 50. So that actually makes sense because remember, line seven is looking at the global x. And then if I call my func, it redefines that global x 25 to be equal to 50 only inside the scope of the function and then returns x, which in this case, it will print out 50. Now, sometimes what confuses students is this third line. What happens if I say print x? And what happens if I say print x after I call my func in this manner? So let's comment these out and see what happens. So take some time. What do you expect to happen here on lines 9 and 10? I'm going to run this and we'll see. I get x is equal to 25. Hopefully that's what you also expected. If you expected x is equal to 50, let me quickly explain why that didn't happen. And that has to do with scope. When we redefine x is equal to 50 inside of a function, that reassignment is limited to the scope of the function, meaning it doesn't actually do the reassignment in what's known as the global namespace. And that has to do with those scope levels. Remember, it goes local, enclosing functions, global, and then built in. So here, when we call my function, x is only being redefined inside of this function namespace. And then when I say print x, it's going to call this global x because it really has nothing to do with this function call. Okay, so let's see some more examples of LEGB, that scoping level, in order to really understand what's going on here. So that's our little experiment to kind of introduce the idea of scope. But let's go ahead and create a land expression. This will begin to show the very first level, which is the local level. So if I have a land expression that looks something like this, lambda x, x to the power of two, this particular x is local. So this is a local level. Now let's show you enclosing function locals. And this is the next level. So this occurs when we have a function inside of another function, and which is known as nested functions. So again, for this lambda example, you would probably have this inside of another function. But let's show you enclosing function locals, this next level. 
I'm going to create a variable called name and say this is a global name. And the reason it's global is because it's not inside of any function. It's at the top level of this .py file, which is sometimes also known as a module, although we haven't really saved it as a module and aren't calling it in another .py file. It's just a simple .py file, but it is outside of any function, so it's at the global level. Now I create a function called greet. And inside of this greet function, I'm going to assign name to be Sammy. And inside of this function, I define another function called hello. And then I say print hello plus name. Then outside of all these functions, I'm going to call greet. Let's save this. And hopefully, you will know when I run this what's going to happen. So I will say Python notes.py. Take your time, and before you actually run this, think about what you expect to happen. Note here that I'm calling greet. Think about, does greet return anything or perform any action? So we hit enter, and we get nothing out. And that makes sense, because so far, greet, all it does is it reassigns name equal to Sammy in its function namespace here, and then it has a function defined inside of it. However, no function is actually called inside of greet. If we want to actually print hello plus Sammy, I have to call hello. So I've only defined it so far. And look here how I'm calling hello lined up with its DEF call. If I did this, call hello within the function hello, that wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't know what hello is and you'd get an error there. So we're going to do this and now let's see what happens when I call Python notes.py. I get hello Sammy. So note how Sammy was used because the hello function was enclosed inside of the greet function. So what's actually happening here? I have this global variable name. Inside of the greet function, I reassign name to be equal to Sammy. I assign hello being equal to print hello name. And the most outer level it first looks for name is right here inside this enclosing function. If I put a hashtag here and comment this out, then it's not going to find name outside of it. So it's going to look at the next level, which is going to end up being global. So now let's run Python notes.py and we should see, hello, this is a global name. And there it is, hello, this is a global name. So you can see here the different levels of where Python is looking for variable names in the namespace. And that's really the whole point of scope, knowing what variables are going to be used if you have things like nested functions. And it's always important to remember, and this is sometimes a point of confusion, it doesn't matter if inside of a function scope, I redefine name. If I go back outside of this function completely and ask to print the name, it's going to find it here globally first. It's not going to be able to go inside a function and look for it because it really has no business going inside the function until it's been called. And even if the function has been called, that variable namespace is only here in this local function scope. So let me run this, hit Python notes, and I see, hello, Sammy, this is a global name because I said name is equal to Sammy. So greet in its scope, when it calls hello, name is equal to Sammy. But when I say print name, it goes to the global one. Name, this is a global name. Okay, now beyond this, there is the built-in level. And the built-in level is just things that are already built in. So things like LEN, basically anything that pops up in this list here to help you out is built into Python. And these are things that you never want to actually redefine. You would never want to say LEN, is equal to 23. Otherwise, you're never gonna be able to call the length function again. You would have accidentally redefined it in the global space. So again, these are built-in function names in Python. You should never overwrite these, and you will know what you've typed based off the syntax highlighting and based off the fact that it's already trying to help you finish that statement before you've even defined it. Okay, so let's talk a bit, a little, bit little bit more about local variables. When you declare variables inside of a function definition, they are not related in any way to other variables with the same names used outside of the function. And that's a key point I keep repeating myself on. So variable names are local to that function. And this is called the scope of the variable itself. All variables have the scope of the block that they are declared in, starting from the point of definition of the name. So let's show you another example. And this is going to seem like a repetitive example. So if you kind of already get it, Maybe you can continue off with this lecture, going on to the next one. But if you're still a little confused, let's show you a couple more examples. So I'm creating a function, and I define at the top globally that x is equal to 50. And then I say, 
def, take function x, and I'm going to say colon here, print x is, and then we can say comma x there. This is kind of like a fast way to print something. And then I will say x here, redefine it to be 1000, and then after that I will print x local x change to comma x. So I will save this, and then outside of this I will call func x. Save it, and then if I hit python notes.py, note here it says x is 50, so since it hasn't found anything redefining x before line 4, it goes to the global space. Okay, x equals 50. Then locally, we redefine x to be 1000, and it says local x changed to 1000. But here's the main catch. If I say, outside of this function, even after the function's been called, print x, and I run this, you get back to 50. So here, if we're in the global namespace, we're going to look for things in the global namespace. So the first time that we print the value of the name x with the first line in the function's body, Python uses the value of the parameter declared in the main block, above the function definition. Next, we assign the value there, x, to 1000. And the name x is local to our function now. So when we change the value of x inside of that function, the x defined in the main block remains unaffected. Now what I mean by main block is the x up here. So if that last print statement, what we're actually doing is we display the value of x as defined in that main block thereby confirming that it's actually unaffected by this local assignment. Now let's say you're in a situation where within inside of a function, you actually want to change the global x. So far, it seems like you're only limited to changing the local x. What if you actually wanted this function to reach out, go to the global uh, level, and rename x here to be 1000? How can we do that? Well, the way you can do that is with the global keyword call. Now, as a quick note, it's recommended that you try to avoid using the global keyword call, because doing this, if you have a really long line of code or a really large file of code, can really mess up your namespace if you're not super careful about it. So again, I'm showing it to you here, but I don't recommend that you ever actually use the global name or global keyword unless you really have to. But basically, what the global keyword does is it says, hey, I'm going to be using the global x. So when I call x here, I want to actually reach out to that global namespace grab that x, and then play around with it inside here. So if I say def func x and declare global x, and we're actually going to not even take any input here, we'll just say call the function, grab x from the global namespace using that global keyword, and then say x is equal to 1000. Then I'm going to save this, and here what I'm going to do is say print before function call, x is, and then say comma x. And let's comment these two lines out for now. So all I'm doing here is I'm never, act I've only defined this function, I'm never actually calling it, I'm just saying x is equal to 50. So we would expect this to say print before function call, x is equal to 50. So I run Python notes.py, and it says before function call, x is equal to 50. Now I'm going to call function. And note here, inside of this function, I'm calling global x, which allows this function to reach the global namespace and grab that x. Then, after this, I'm going to copy and paste this, put it here, and then say after. Save it. Run this. And note what happened. It says before function call, x is 50. After the function call, x is 1000. So now, with this global keyword, I've been actually able to rename or redefine or reassign something in the global namespace. So now that x is equal to 1000 is actually causing that effect to be permanent. Again, if I do something like this, comment this out, and I just say x is equal to 1000, then if I run this, I get twice x is equal to 50, x is equal to 50. So that global keyword allows you to reach out to the global namespace and actually clarify that, no, I do want to reassign that global variable x. Again, this can be really confusing if you end up having a bunch of global calls all over your .py script. So it's recommended that you try to avoid global. Instead, what you should do is use return keywords. So if you actually wanted to send back an x, you wouldn't want to say x is equal to 1000. You'd want to say, x is equal to 1000, return x. And then with that return statement, you can use it in the global namespace. So then you would say 
something like x is equal to func and then run something like this. And here we get 51,000. So this use of the return statement has pretty much the same effect as if when we had the global keyword without any of the risk of accidentally redefining something in the global space. Okay, so that's all we really need to discuss about scope in Python. We won't see such complicated examples when we're working with Django, but it is something I want you to be aware of as you continue to program. If you have any questions, I definitely suggest you check out the part1scope.py script, which has full notes and many more examples of what we covered here. Always feel free to post the Q&A forums if anything confused you. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part two, object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is a way to use Python to create our own objects. And sometimes it can be a point of great confusion for beginners, and mainly because it's often just taught poorly. You're kind of just thrown into object-oriented programming, taught a few keywords, and expected to understand everything all at once. We're going to try our best to save you from any confusion by systematically building up and showing you slowly the thought process behind object-oriented programming, otherwise known as OOP, and why we'd even need to use it. We will use it quite a bit for Django, so let's get started by showing you the basics. This is going to be a single.py file for the notes, part two object-oriented programming.py, but it's going to be multiple video lectures. So keep that in mind. We're gonna break it into understandable steps. Let's go to the editor now. All right, let's start off by trying to understand the fundamental idea behind object-oriented programming. Why would we even want to use it? Well, hopefully you remember when we were first learning about basic data types and basic structures, I could do something like this, say my list, is equal to one, two, three. And then when I said my list dot, notice that I get a bunch of methods here, append, count, extend, pop, remove, etc. So there's a lot of methods available to me on this object. And then I could say append the four here, save this, and then do something like print my list. I save this, run python notes.py, or whatever file you have, and I get one, two, three, four. Now the idea behind object-oriented programming is this. So far, we have the capability to create a very simple function or even a very complex function. What we don't yet know how to do is build something like a list object. We don't know yet how can you build an object and then have methods inside of it or attributes inside of it that you can use to affect the object itself. And that's the whole idea of object-oriented programming. How are we able to actually create our own objects in Python? We know how to use the built-in objects in Python, but we yet don't know how to actually build our own. And the first step on your journey of learning about object-oriented programming is to realize that in Python, everything is an object. And you can check an object type by saying type and then passing in an object itself. So for example, if I pass in a list here, I don't have to save it as a variable. I can just say type and let's print out that type. So I will say print type here. It tells me it's of the class list. And class is going to be one of the keywords we use when we're actually learning about object-oriented programming. So here I know that this is type list. And I don't even actually have to have anything inside of it. It can just be an empty list. I can run this and it'll say class list. And if I replace this just to be parentheses, remember that's how we define a tuple. So if I save this and run this, it says class tuple. And we can see this for a variety of things. Let's say I pass in a number, type, make sure my parentheses are balanced there. And I run this, it'll say class int or class integer. Make this 20.0, save this, run this, and it says class floating point. So what we wanna know is how can we create our own classes in order to create our own object. So we keep seeing this keyword class and we wanna know how can we use it. So let's actually show you. So now that we understand everything in Python is an object, we can use the class keyword. And the user defined objects are created using this keyword. The class is essentially a blueprint that defines the nature of a future object. And from classes, we can then construct instances of that class. An instance is just a specific object created from a particular class. So for example, previously we created the object myList. That was an instance of a list object. Let's see how we can actually use class. First off, you start with the class keyword. And if you hit enter here, you'll get class auto-completed for you. Let's create a sample class. And note the syntax highlighting here. And by convention, 
Class names are always capitalized. That way you know whether you're calling a class or a function. Functions are lowercase, classes are start with an uppercase. Then we have close parentheses, colon, and then what goes here in your class. Right now, I'm going to use the pass keyword to not do anything. We'll just say pass. So I'm going to save that. And then over here, I will say x is equal to, and I will say sample, close parentheses. And then I'm going to print the type of x. Save this. Let's run it. And here it says class main.sample. And we'll discuss what main is in a future lecture. But right now, we can see that I'm getting a very similar result to what I saw previously with the built-in classes. I've now created my own class and my own object called sample, all using the class keyword. All right, that's it for this lecture. So far, all I want you to understand is that everything in Python is an object, and we can create our own objects using the class keyword. And we can check with the type built-in function what the actual class is. Coming up next, we're going to learn how to add attributes and methods to a class. And we're going to start right where we left off in this video. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to where we left off last time. So last time we created this sample class. It's very simple, it just has the pass keyword. But really what we're going to have in classes are attributes and methods. Attributes are characteristics of an object. Methods are operations we can perform on the object. So for example, what we will be doing is creating a class called dog. And an attribute of a dog may be the dog's breed or the dog's pet name. While a method of a dog can be something like the bark method, which will return a sound. We can say print woof woof, something of that nature. So let's start off by learning about attributes. So I will make this class be dog. And then let's change sample to be dog here. And let's say instead of lowercase x, we'll call this my dog, kind of like the same way we created something called my list. And then let's check the type of my dog. So we'll save this, run python notes.py, and here I can see class main.dog. So far, so good. So what we need to do is start off with attributes. The syntax for creating an attribute is self dot the attribute name equals something. But there's a special method. So whenever you have a class, what you're going to be doing is defining methods inside that class. And the methods look like functions inside of a class. So we start off with the DEF keyword. And then a special method has a set of underscores surrounding its name. So we say underscore underscore init underscore underscore then we pass in self and then we can have a colon here and here I will just put in pass so this is the most basic special method you can have the init method and that stands for initialization and this self keyword is always necessary basically what the self keyword here does is it tells that this method refers to itself itself being the actual class object so if we save this and run it we shouldn't see anything else different pop up. So we still have class dog. What we're going to do now is inside this initialization method, this init method, remember it has two sets of underscores surrounding it, defining it as a special method. What we do is we add more attributes. So for instance, let's add in breed. So dogs can have a breed. And then what we do here is we have the syntax that looks like this. We say self dot breed is equal to breed. And this is where it can get a little bit confusing. So what we will do is run this and we should expect an error to pop up. And it will say init missing one required positional argument, breed, which now means whenever I create an instance of a dog class, I require breed as an argument. So here we say dog, let's provide it a breed. So we will say create a dog with the breed and we'll pass in a string called lab. We save this, run this again, and now I see I have class main dog. So what we're going to do now is instead of printing the type of my dog, since we know now that it's always going to be a dog class, I'm going to say print my dog dot breed. And then if I run this, notice I get back out lab. And also note that I don't have closed parentheses around breed. 
I don't have something like this, and that's because it's an attribute. It's not a method. I don't want to call it to action. I just want to report back what that attribute is. So let's break this all down one more time. We have that init method, and it's called automatically right after the object has been created. So once we initialize the object, we actually call this method automatically. And then each attribute in a class definition begins with a reference to the instance object. And that, by convention, is this self keyword, which is basically saying refer to this particular instance of this object. The breed here is the argument, and the value is passed during the instantiation or initialization of the class itself, where we say breed is equal to lab here. And now we've created an instance of the dog class. So let's create one other instance. We can say other dog is equal to dog breed equal to and we'll say husky. Save that and then let's print out the other dog dot breed. Save it. We run this and we see we have lab and husky come out. Now let's practice adding one more attribute. So I'm going to get rid of this other dog and we'll just stick with my dog. Get rid of this other dog as well. And this dog or dogs in general won't just have breeds, let's say they have names. So it's kind of like a pet name. So what we do for every attribute, what we do is we say self dot, and then the name of that attribute is equal to name. And again, what this is doing is it's saying self, which refers to this dog, dot name, so the attribute name for this dog is equal to name, which is going to be the name here. So again, this name on the right hand side of the equal sign refers to the input name. This self dot name is kind of assigning the dot name to the initialization of that dog. So now if I save this and try to run this, I will get an error because I need to provide a name. So it says init is missing one required positional argument name. So let's give it a name and we'll name this Sammy, which is my real dog. Now if I run this, I get lab, and I can also print out my dog's name. So we'll say my dog dot name. Save this, run it, and now I see lab and Sammy. And usually when creating an actual instance of an object, you won't specify breed is equal to something, name is equal to something, unless you want to really specifically uh, target that. So you come back to your code and read, oh yeah, lab stands for breed, Sammy stands for name. If you're really comfortable with an object and you tend to use it a lot, what you'll end up seeing is something more along the lines of this, where you just say lab and Sammy. They have to go in the correct order to be assigned to breed and name, but you'll most likely see an instantiation of an object look like that. And if I run this code, I get back the same thing, lab and Sammy. All right, that's the very basics of attributes. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to post the Q&A forums, but I also recommend that you check out the part two object-oriented-programming.py, which has a lot of notes and a lot of explanatory text for everything we're doing here. Next, I want to talk about class object attributes. So class object attributes are always the same for any instance of the class. So for example, for a particular dog, you may have a different breed or you may have a different name. However, all dogs are mammals. Regardless of their breed or regardless of their name, they're always going to be a mammal. What we can do in that case is add what's known as a class object attribute. And a class object attribute goes outside of any of these special methods or normal methods at the very top. So we'll say class object attribute to point it out. And then I can say something like species is equal to mammal. And if you study biology, you know that uh, species doesn't actually relate to mammal. It's more of the class of uh, mammalia, I believe. But cut me some slack here because I can't really use this class keyword. So we'll just say species is equal to mammal, regardless if that's biologically correct. All right, so now I'm going to save this. I run this again, and I see lab Sammy. So no, I haven't actually defined species is equal to mammal here. That's taken as a class object attribute to be true, regardless of what kind of dog I have. So whether it's a husky, a lab, regardless of what his name is, if I say print my dog dot species, I will get back mammal, which makes sense. Regardless of whatever I want the breed or name to be, this class object attribute will always be true to be equal to mammal. 
Okay, now let's move on to actual methods. Methods are functions defined inside the body of a class. They are used to perform operations with the attributes of our objects, and methods are essential in encapsulation concepts of the object-oriented programming paradigm. And this is essential in dividing the responsibilities in programming, especially in large applications. And basically, methods are kind of the whole point of why you would want to even create your own object. So let's kind of delete all this and show you some more examples of how to create a class, not just of attributes, but with methods themselves. So I will create a class, and I will call it circle class. And I'm going to give it a class object attribute where pi is equal to 3.14. Now there are ways to call pi from the math library in Python, but we'll just ignore that for now. We'll say that regardless of what kind of circle you have, the pi, that special number, is always going to be equal to 3.14, or estimated. Next, I'm going to create my initialization special method. You're always going to have this. So we'll say underscore underscore init, so initialize with self, and every circle in order to be defined needs a radius. So we'll say radius. And if we want to be instantiated with a default parameter, just like we could with a normal function, I can say equals one, which means if I don't provide a radius, I will provide the default value of one. And since I have radius there, I need to say self.radius. So self.radius, which means this circle.radius is going to be equal to the input radius. Now let's create an instance of circle. We'll call it my C is equal to circle, close parentheses, and then I'm going to print my C dot radius. Save that, run our notes, and we see here my radius is one, perfect. Okay, so let's show an example of a method. And remember that methods are functions defined inside the body of a class. And basically they're going to allow us to perform actions based off the attributes of the object. So let's create a method that calculates the area of a circle. We'll call it DEF area, and we need to pass in the keyword self, S-E-L-F. And that basically tells this method area that it's not just some free floating function inside of this class, it's actually a method of that class. And that's what the self keyword is doing. Then I'm going to calculate the area. And remember that the area of a circle is just its radius, squared, so radius times radius, times pi. But here's an issue if I just type this out. This is a common mistake that beginners make. They type radius times radius times pi, and they think they're good to go. But the problem here is, what radius are you talking about? Are you talking about this circle's radius or some variable called radius? The way to make sure that you know you're talking about this circle's own radius when you actually instantiate it is you need to say, self.radius, and that tells this method, hey, look at the object's current radius and call it self.radius. And I need to do the same thing here. And then since pi is an object level attribute, what I can do is say circle.pi. And now if I save that, let's create a circle, my C, with the radius equal to three. If I save this, run this, I get back out as my output three, which makes sense. Now let's see what happens if I call area, and let's call area with no open and close parentheses, just area like this, and see what happens. I hit enter, and I get an interesting line of output. I get that I have a bound method, circle.area, of main circle object at this kind of sequence of letters and numbers. What this actually means is this. If I just call dot area, that is a method bound to the circle class. And it's a particular instance of the circle class object located at this position in my computer's memory. If I actually want to execute this method, I need to, just like I would for a function, have a set of open and closed parentheses on it. Then when I run this code, Python notes.py, I see here that my area is 28.26, or estimated to be, given that we're using 3.14 as our value of pi. Now let's imagine that I want to have a method that allows me to reset the radius. So there's two ways you can change attributes of a class in Python. One way is to just call it directly off the object itself. So we can say my C dot radius is now equal to, we'll put in 100 to make it really obvious, 
And then if I call my c.area, we'll get a different answer. So if I run Python notes this time, I get uh, 31,400 because I redefine the radius. Sometimes you actually just want to have a method in order to redefine something like that so that it's really clear. So let's make a very simple method that says set radius. It'll take in self and then it will take in some new parameter which will be something like new r. And then I will grab my current radius, which is self.radius, and set it equal to new r. And note that I'm not returning anything. And that's OK. Not all object methods need to return something. Some object methods just affect the object in place. So now, instead of saying my c equals, or my c.radius is equal to 100, what I can do is say my c dot set radius and then pass in that new r value, 100. And this, well, just to show that this is working, let's pass in something like 999. So when I run this, I get some huge number here. So that's one way you can create methods that reset object attributes. It's sometimes more common to see it my, the way we first saw it with my c dot radius is equal to something else. Sometimes, depending if you have a really large file, or you work with people that you really want to make sure they're doing things correctly, you set it to a particular method. It's really up to you. That's more of a programming choice, programming style choice, that is. All right, so, so far we've covered methods and attributes. In the next section, we're going to be covering inheritance of different objects, and then we'll discuss some special methods. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. If you have any questions, feel free to post the Q&A forums, and I'm happy to help you out. Hello everyone and welcome back to where we left off last time. In this lecture, we'll be discussing two topics, inheritance and special methods. Inheritance is a way to form new classes using older classes that have already been defined. That way, the newly formed classes are called derived classes, and the classes that we derive from are called the base classes. So you derive from the base class. Important benefits of inheritance are code reuse and reduction of complexity of a program. That way you don't have to constantly be creating duplicate classes. You can just inherit from another class and use some of the methods that are available there. So let's see an example of this. I'm going to create a base class, and this base class is going to be called animal class. And the animal class, it needs its initialization method. Remember, that's a special method in it. And here we'll just have self. And then we'll say print animal created. So we're doing very, a very simple class just to show kind of the idea behind inheritance. Usually you won't have a print statement inside of the initialization method. You'll just have self dot and then all your attribute assignments. Then I'm going to create another method called who am I. And we'll call it self. And then this is going to print animal. And then here I'm going to say eat this will also take in self, and then this will just print eating. That needs to be a string. All right, so a very simple class. It just prints things. When you call these two methods on it, it prints something else. So let's actually kind of play around with this and explore it a little bit. I'll make an animal. We'll call it, say, my a is equal to animal, instantiate that, and then let's have it say something like, my a dot who am I and then my a dot eat and no I don't have to wrap this in print because the print is already inside of these two methods so let's call python nose.py and I see here animal and eating perfect all right now let's say I want to create a new class of dog now all dogs are animals so I want to inherit from the base class of animal so what I'm going to do here is instead of just passing nothing in these parentheses, I will pass in the other class, which was animal. And I don't have closed parentheses here. I'm just passing the whole class in there. And then I'm going to say def init, pass in self. And then when I actually create the initialization, I'm going to call animal dot init, and then pass in self here. And then I'm going to print 
dog created. So we will save this. And then notice when I ran this the first time, it said animal created, animal eating. So that was for when I created an animal, it said animal created. When I said who am I, it said animal. When I said eating, it said, or when I said eat, it said eating. So what I'm going to do now is save this, and then I'm not going to create an animal. Instead, I'm going to create a dog. And we'll have this be, let's say it's my dog, my dog, who am I? and then my dog here. Now when I save this and run it, Python notes.py, and expand this so we can see the output here, it says animal created, dog created, animal eating. So that makes sense because when I created a dog, I said animal here in it self. So it means initialize an animal. And then I'm going to say print dog created. Now I don't actually have to have this initialization line. So I'm going to comment that out. And now let's actually see what happens when I run this. It says dog created animal eating. So note that even though the class dog does not have who am I or eat methods inside of it, it was able to inherit those methods or derive those methods from the base class of animal. And that's basically the entire idea behind inheritance is the fact that you can inherit from another class or derive another class. And then you can see here, I can call who am I and eat, even though they're not strictly defined inside of this dog class. Now I can also create new methods here. So I can say something like bark, it takes in self, and then it says print woof. So now I can go all the way down here and say my dog dot bark, close parentheses, and when I run this, I should be able to see my new class wolf. Now I can also overwrite classes. So I'm not strictly limited to everything that was an animal. If I want eat to say dog eating, I can do that as well. All I have to do is just say def and then call eat, pass in self, and then basically write over it. So here I will say now dog eating. Save that. So when I run this again, Python notes, I see that a dog's created animal dog eating wolf. So I was able to successfully overwrite the previous method. And you can check out the notes for more examples of this. But the basic idea I want you to get is that if you've already created a class and you want to use some of those methods in a new class, all you have to do is inherit it like this and you can then derive from the base class. All right, so special methods are basically going to allow you to perform special operations. And these methods are not actually called directly, but they're called by specific Python language syntax. Let me show you what I mean by that. Imagine that I create a list and we'll say my list is equal to one, two, three. And then I say print my list. And if I run this Python notes.py, I see one, two, three, I've printed my list. Zoom a little bit out. Now what happens if I create my own class and try to print it? So I will create a class called book. And this is going to be a very simple things so far, we'll say def, we'll pass in our init special method, we'll say self, and this will also have a title, an author, and pages. And then what we will do here is say colon and assign those attributes. So self.title is equal to the title, self.author is equal to the author provided, and then say self pages is equal to the pages provided. Whoops. Pages. Great. And now what I will do is say B is equal to book, close parentheses, and then add in the title. So the Python is the title. We also need to add in the author, Jose, and we'll say it's 200 pages long. And I'm going to say print B, print my book. So this is kind of the exact same thing we did here, except notice what happens when I run this. If I say Python notes.py, I hit enter. When I print out my book object, it says main.bookobject at its location in memory. So the question arises, what is the print function actually doing? And how can I get it to print out something that looks nicer? Something that says like title, Python, author, Jose, pages 200. Well, what happens when you call the print function on an object is it looks for its string representation. And right now we haven't actually specifically defined the book's string representation. We need to use what's known as a special method to do that. And all special methods inside of a class 
are annotated with two underscores, the name of the special method, and then two extra underscores. And we can see here the syntax highlighting also notes that they're a special method. And they all need to take in the self argument. So this special method, str, is the string representation of my object. So whenever a function asks for the string representation of my object, and the print function does that, it will return whatever I put here to return. So we'll just say return hello. We save that, and now when we run this, we get back hello when I print out my book. And let's delete this my list, since we won't be using it anymore. So realistically, you're not going to want to say return hello, but instead you're going to want to return a string representation that actually makes sense. And for our case, a string represent representation that might make sense is something like title, and we'll use some print formatting here, author, and then let's say pages. And then we will say dot format, and we pass in self.title, comma, self.author, comma, self.pages. And we will save this, and let's check to see if we made any errors and if everything runs correctly. Okay, here we go. When I actually called to print b or print that book, print the actual function looked for a string representation, and that was returned by the special method. In which case, we got back title Python author Jose pages 200. And this is how you're going to going to typically see the special method str for string representation used. Now let's show you a couple more useful special methods. So another special method is the len or length method. So imagine I call len on a list, one, one, two, three. I know I will get back the number three indicating three elements inside of that list. But what happens if I call length on b? Well, I can return or save this and run it. And let's actually print out len b. But notice what happens, I should get an error. And it says object of type book has no length, which means I need to add in a special method, def underscore underscore len underscore underscore. And this is the length method. So underscore underscore, let me make sure I have balanced underscores. Okay, it's two on each side. I type in self. And then what I end up doing is returning whatever I want the length representation to be of my book. And a good representation here, the length of a book, would probably be the pages. So I call self.pages. Note that I'm calling self.pages and not just pages by itself. So now let's see if we can print the length of the book without any errors. And we get back 200, which makes sense because that's what I defined here as the length of the book. So what this length function that's built into Python does is it goes inside the object checks if it has a special method, len, and then returns whatever that method tells it to return. And then finally, one other special method that you may find yourself encountering, and there are a lot of special methods. As you can see here, all of these are special methods, so anything that is wrapped in two sets of underscores is a special method, and there's a whole bunch of them, but I'm just showing you the most common ones. We'll explore more as we continue on with Django later on, but delete is another special method you might find yourself running into, and that's just when you call delete. So I will say print a book is destroyed. And the way you can delete an object from memory space is with DEL and then whatever the object name was. So now if I run this code, I get back, I created a book, but a book has been destroyed. All right, that's all you need to know for special methods. The most common one we'll probably be using throughout the rest of the course is this one, the str, the string representation. Because if we ever want to print something, it's important that we have the method to do that and not get any errors. All right, thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture where we're going to be walking through a project for you to do to practice object-oriented programming. Hello everyone, and welcome to part three OOP project. Object-oriented programming is fundamental to becoming a good Python programmer, and we're going to be using it so much in Django that it's great to get some extra practice by building a game. We'll use object-oriented programming to create the card game known as War. It's a very simple card game. The relevant file for this lecture is part 3 ooppproject.py, and there's also a solutions file. Don't check the solutions file yet until you've attempted the project. Feel free to either treat this as a code-along project, where you just go straight to the solutions lecture and actually code along with me, 
but I do recommend that you attempt it on your own first. Let's take a quick look at the actual project file, which has some extra code to help you out if you attempt to do this on your own. I'll jump to my editor now. Okay, so here I have part 3 OOP project.py file open, and when you open this file, you'll notice that there's a bunch of commented code. These are just the rules of the game War. If you haven't played War or don't really know what it's about, you can read this to actually understand the rules, or you can actually read the Wikipedia link to War, the card game. But the basic rules are very simple, and the way we're going to do it for this project is you playing versus the computer. What's going to happen is you have a deck of cards, it gets split in half, and half of it's face down to you, half of it is face down to the computer. And you and the computer will flip one card face up at the same time. Whoever has the higher card wins both of those cards. And that's the basic premise of war. But there's a special event that happens when both cards that you pull face up happen to be equal to each other in rank. If that's the case, then you and the computer pull out an extra three cards, and then you pull out another card to actually compare to each other. And then whoever wins that wins the war and then wins all of those cards. So that would be all 10 cards. Okay, so then we want to scroll down here and we can see that I've imported some useful things for you. So I've created already from random import shuffle and then we have two lists here that are really useful for creating cards. Uh, they're just lists that are created by splitting a string based on the white space. So you can play around with those. You don't have to use them, but they're there just to help you out. Then we have the deck class, the hand class, the player class, and then some gameplay. So what you're going to be doing is the following. You're going to be using this deck class, and this object will create a deck of cards to initiate play. And you can then use this deck list of cards to split in half and give to the players. It will also be able to use these uh, two lists here to create the deck. It should also have a method for splitting and cutting the deck in half and shuffling the deck. We also have the hand class, and each player has a hand, and they can add or remove cards from that hand and there should be an add or remove card method within this class. Then we have the player class, and that takes in a name and an instance of a hand class object. And the player can then play cards and check if they still have cards. And then finally, over here, we'll have gameplay. Again, you don't actually have to use these three specific classes, but you do have to use at least one class and use object-oriented programming in some way. But this is just skeleton code here, just some scaffolding for you to fill out if you want to follow along with the solutions. Okay, best of luck, and coming up next is the solution lecture where we will be coding along an example solution. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part three OOP project solutions lecture. In this lecture, we're going to be coding through an example solution to the card war game project. Let's hop to the editor and get started. Okay, here we are at the file, so let's scroll down and get started with the object-oriented programming of the deck class. So the first thing we always need in a class is the init special method to initialize this, and it will always take in self. And just to make things obvious, I'll add a print statement in here. You usually don't have print statements like this, but we'll just add it in anyways, and we'll say creating new ordered deck. And then what I'm going to do is say self dot all cards is equal to, and what I could do is have the logic be inside the initialization or have the logic be outside the initialization. So what I mean by that is I'm going to have a global variable here called my cards and set that equal to a list comprehension that is tuple for the suit and the rank of the cards and say for s and suits for or suites for r in ranks. So that's one way to do this. You could have also done this with a nested for loop. So just to walk through that example, you could have said something like for r in ranks for s in suites and then have some you could say my cards dot append SR, a tuple there, with my cards being equal to some blank list. So this is the exact same thing as this. So keep that in mind. If you need to pause the screen and kind of break down this list comprehension and compare it to this nested for loop, that's all that's happening here. But I could then pass in my cards over here during the initialization step. But instead of doing that, I'm just going to grab this list comprehension, 
delete this and then put that in here. Okay, so that actually creates the deck and it all happens inside the class. Again, you don't have to do it this way. There's many ways to actually do this, but we'll just create the deck here. So that's a new ordered deck. If I want to shuffle the deck, I'll pass in self. And then let's add in a print statement just to make things really obvious since this is a project to learn with. We will say shuffling deck. And I will call the shuffle function on that list, which is self.allcards. And then I also want to be able to split the cards in half. So I will create a new method, split in half. That takes in self. And then what this is going to do is it's going to say return self.allcards. And I know there's 52 cards in a deck, so that I need to go from the beginning all the way to index 26, up to but not including it. And then self all cards from 26 onwards. So that will return a tuple of the split cards. Up next is the hand class. So this is the hand class and each player is going to have a hand and they can add or remove cards from that hand. So what's going to happen here is I will initialize this with self and then cards. And then I will say self.cards is equal to cards. And then let's also have a method here, a special method for printing out the hand. So we'll pass in self and let's return using print formatting contains blank cards and we'll say dot format and let's return the length of self.cards. That way I know how many cards is in the player's hand. So that's what's going to happen if I ever print a hand. It's just going to report back how many cards that player has in their hand. Then finally, I want the two methods that are add or remove. So I will create an add method, which takes in self and then the added cards. So that's going to be a list. And I'm going to say self.cards dot, and I want to not append, but extend my list with the added cards. So in the middle of the table, they're the cards that the computer played, the cards that you played, that will be a list, and then we will extend that list. Maybe you decided to do it a different way, that's totally fine too. And then we'll have a method called remove card. That will just be self, and this will pop off the top card here, or the very last card, I should say. Cards pop, and there we go. Now we have the class player. So let's play around with that. First off, I wanna initialize the player. So we'll say underscore underscore init self and a player should have a name and they will also have a hand. And then I will say self dot name is equal to name. And I will also say self dot hand whoops, is equal to hand. And let's create some more methods here. I'll create a play card method. And the play card method is going to have a variable called drawn card, which is just self dot hand dot remove card. So remember remove card from that hand object. So the player is going to get a hand object when we actually create it. I can call remove card and add card from that hand object, which in my case is just self dot hand. So this is sometimes a little bit confusing because you kind of see these uh, multiple calls here, but it's just self dot hand dot remove card. And then let's add a print statement so we really know what's going on here. I'll say brackets has placed brackets and then let's say dot format and I will say self dot name so that's the player name has placed and then we'll put in the drawn card. So whenever I play a card it will say player has placed and then whatever card I drew. And then we can also print a new line here. So that way our console, when we're printing a bunch of stuff, doesn't actually get stuffed with a bunch of commands. We can read it better. And then finally, I want to return the card I drew, which is the drawn card. The next method I want is some method to remove the war card. So we'll say remove underscore war cards, self. And then what's going to happen here is I'll have a local variable called war cards, set it equal to an empty list. And I will say for x in range three. 
So if both the computer player and you pass two cards and they are the same rank, then we have war. So I'm going to need something to actually remove the three top war cards. So I'll say for X in range three, war cards dot append self dot hand dot cards dot pop. So what's actually happening here? Well, if I match with the computer, I need to grab those war cards and I will grab them as a list and return them as a list. Then I'll say for X in range three, which basically means for these three cards, take the war cards and append self.hand.cards.pop. And we could have also done that with uh, remove. It's really up to you. There's so many ways to do this that you shouldn't feel uh, obligated to do it exactly like I did it. So here we see hand.cards.pop. What could I have also done is just remove card, which is self.cards.pop. So again, .cards.pop, that should be the exact same thing as me saying remove card. So I could have done with this, remove card. That's the exact same thing. Uh, choose whatever makes most sense to you. Usually you'd probably wanna actually take advantage of the method, but we'll leave it the other way for now in case this may be a little more clear uh, for the user, but it, it's really up to you. And then I also want to have a method here called still has cards. And all this does and we can add in some documentation here or a doc string. This will return true if player still has cards left. Because remember when a player runs out of cards, then the game's over. So what I'm going to do is just return the length of self.hand.cards, whoops, that should be a H, is not equal to zero. So that will just return true if the player still has cards left. Okay, so we just created a whole bunch of functions. Let's quickly review all of them. So starting from the very top of the deck. Remember I have these two helper lists. What I do here is I create this object, self.allcards, and that's just this giant list of all the cards in the deck. Then I can shuffle all the cards in the deck, and then I can split that deck in half. And note, when I split the deck in half, I actually return a tuple, which means I can use tuple unpacking to grab the first half of the deck and then the second half of the shuffle deck. Then I have the hand class. And what this does is it just reports back uh, how many cards I have here in this hand. Then I can add cards to the hand, which is extension, extension, excuse me, and then remove card, which pops a card off. Then I have the player class. The player has a name and one of those hand objects. They can play a card, which means they just remove a card, and it tells you what card they place down, and then it returns that drawn card. We also have remove war cards, which means if I have war present, then I will call range three and remove those cards. Again, I can use dot cards dot pop, or I can just call dot remove card. It's up to you, whatever's more clear to you. Then I have DF still has cards, which just returns true if the player still has cards. So now let's actually say welcome to war and begin. I want to use all three classes to do this. So let's kind of mark down what we have to do first. To do this, what I have to do is create a new deck and split it in half. So let's do that. That should be T there, create. So I'll create a new deck object, set it equal to D. And let's zoom in here a little more so we can see what's going on since we're towards the bottom. Let's make some space for us. So I create a deck object and I'm going to call the shuffle method on that deck and that's in place. And then I'm going to use tuple unpacking to grab the two halves of the deck, half one, half two. And that's going just going to be D dot split in half. And then I want to create both players. I'll create the computer player which is going to be a player object called computer. And then it's going to accept the hand object made out of the first half of the cards. And then for the human player, we want them to provide their name. So we'll say input, what is your name? Question mark. And then we'll call this object user. And that will be a player object with that human provided name and hand is just going to be half two. 
And then basically war essentially plays itself. So it's such a simple game that there's no strategy to it. You just keep flipping the cards, check who won, and then take the cards. And if they match, you play war and then just check who won the war. In that case, let's actually make this kind of automatically play. So I will say total rounds, let's not make this a comment, is equal to zero. And then I will also check the war count and see if that's equal to zero. And basically what I'm going to be doing is automatically playing this game for both the human player and the computer, since they essentially don't have to make any decisions. That's how simple a game war is. We will say while user still has cards and the computer still has cards, we will add one to the total rounds. So I will say total rounds plus equal one. And I will print out time for a new round. And then I also print out here are the current standings. And then what I'm going to end up doing is saying print user.name plus has the count. And then I actually want to grab how many player or cards are left. In that case, that's just the actual length. So I will say has the count plus, and we'll cast it to a string. There's many ways you could do this. You could also have built in your own uh, STR special method inside of this. And we can say user.hand.cards. And we're going to do the exact same thing for the computer. So let's do that as well. But instead of username, it will be comp for computer. And instead of user.hand.cards, this will also be comp. All right, very simple. And then we're going to say, just tell them both, play a card, and we will print a new line. So that's just the printing setup of the game. We're going to represent the cards that are on the table that's in between the player deck and the computer deck with a list. We'll say table cards is equal to an empty list. And then when we actually play cards, we'll take the computer card, the C card, and say comp play card method. Remember that returns the card. And then we'll also have a player card, P card, and say user play card. And then I want to add that to the actual table cards list, which means I'll do something like table cards dot append the C card. We just need to use append since it will be a single card. And I also want to say table cards dot append the player card. Then after that, I want to check if there's a war. So if C card of one is equal to P card of one, I'm going to add one to the war count. So I say colon and war count says plus equal one. And the reason I have to use this indexing for one is because remember, if we scroll all the way back up to how we define cards, cards are just tuples themselves. So cards are just tuples that have this suit value and then the ranking. And the ranking is what I want to actually compare. So that's an index one, which is why scrolling all the way back down, when I actually have the cards to compare to each other, I want to grab their rankings and compare it to each other, which is why we had that indexing one. Okay, so that means we have war. So we'll say print war, and then I will grab the table cards, and I'm going to extend the table cards now by user remove war cards. So that just takes the top three cards they have available, and then I'm going to do the exact same thing for the computer. So extend comp dot remove war cards. So I've grabbed the war cards now, and then I want to check who has the higher rank. So if ranks, let's say, if ranks at the index of C card one is greater than, or let's say less than the ranks at the index position of P card one, we will say user dot hand add table cards. 
and then we'll say else we'll add it to the computer's hand. And this doesn't take into account a double war situation. In a double war situation, we'll just say default the computer wins. Again, you could keep adding more logic if you wanted to. All right, so let's actually break this down and kind of explain what's going on here before we continue. This first if statement at the very top is checking the computer card's ranking versus the player card ranking. And if that occurs, then I have a war. So I want to say plus one to the actual war count. And I print out war on the console. And then the cards on the table, remember so far it's just two cards, the initial computer card and the initial player card. I'm going to extend it with three cards from each deck. Three cards from the user deck and then three cards from the computer deck. And then I will say this. Remember ranks is that very top list where I have all the ranks right here. So the ranks are conveniently in order, which means I can compare the index position and the greater index position counts for the higher rank. So then scrolling all the way back down here, what I'm doing with this dot index call off of this ranks list is where, asking where is the index for this particular ranking and where's the index for this particular ranking. So where's the index of the computer card in the ranks list? Where's the index of the player card in the ranks list? And if this, the computer card, is less than the player card, then the user gets all the table cards. Else, the computer is going to get all the table cards. So the player is only going to get it when the computer card ranking is less than theirs on that war. Otherwise, the computer gets all the cards. So even in the case of a tie, we'll just let the computer have all those cards. We could add more logic to check for a double war situation, but we won't worry about that for now, just to keep things very simple. And then I need an else statement to go along with this initial if statement. So, so far, I've checked for war. That's kind of the hard part. The easier part is if there is no war, then all I have to do is directly compare the actual cards. And that's essentially the code I have right here. So I can just copy this and paste it. And that's all I have to do because in this case, I don't have war. So I just need to compare C card one and player card one and then add the appropriate cards. And then what I'm going to do after all of this has been done, meaning this while loop has finished executing. So the user still has cards and the computer still has cards. Eventually one of them is going to run out of cards. I want to print out how many rounds it was. So I will say prints, game over, number of rounds, colon, and then we can just say comma, or I can say plus the string representation of total rounds, and then I can also say prints, a war happened, I'll say plus the string of the war count, and we'll say plus times. And that way we can report back how many times, how many rounds we had, and how many times we had war. So let's save this. I have this all under notes.py. Okay, so it looks like the majority of our code is done, but before we actually run this, it's always a good idea to actually kind of do a quick pass over and see if we're missing anything or not thinking of anything correctly. So if I go all the way to the top, we can kind of check on this. I'm saying for random import shuffle, that looks okay. These two look okay. Class deck, let's check all the methods in each of the classes. Def init, self all cards, and it looks like I'm accidentally missing a in statement here. So for S in suite or suit for R in ranks, shuffle, that looks okay. Split in half, that one's looking okay. Class hand, init, the string, add, remove cards, that's all looking okay. Player, init, that looks okay. Play card, that also looks okay. Remove war cards. So an issue that may arise here with this remove war cards is that if I end the game on a war, I may not actually have three cards left. So what I mean by that is if the computer has most of the cards and you have two left and you happen to draw war, you may get an out of index error when calling for range three. So let's actually add a little bit more code here to check for the war cards. So I will say if the length of self.hand.cards is less than three, I will return all the cards, which is just going to be self.hand.cards. So I will just return all the cards as a list. I won't even bother popping anything off of them. And then I'll have the actual for loop 
become an else statement. So then we can do this. Else for this, return that. So now let's save this, continue on. Still has cards, that check makes sense to me. Gameplay, we just went through all of that, so it should be okay. We check if both players still have cards, we keep running this loop. We take the computer card, the user card, add them to the table cards. We check to see if there's war. Otherwise, we just check those individual cards, and then we play the game. Okay, let's run this and see if it all works. I'm going to open the terminal here, and then I have this under notes.py, so I will just call python notes.py, hit enter. Looks like it's starting off okay. What's your name? We'll say Jose. Hit enter, and it looks like the game actually works. So we say game over, number of rounds, 178 rounds, war happened 16 times. And right now we're actually not reporting who won, which isn't so great. So let's actually report back who won. And the way to do that is just report back their length. So we'll print out computer has, and then let's check how we can grab how many computer cards there are left. So that's the comp still has cards. We can actually just report this back itself. So we'll say computer has, well, instead of saying computer has, we'll say the computer, does the computer still have cards, question mark, and then we'll print back comp still has cards. We'll just turn this into a string. This will be either be true or false. So that will be a string, and then we can do the exact same thing for the player. And this will report back who won. Does the human player still have cards? This will end up being user. Okay, so let's save that, run this again. Say Jose is the name, and then it looks like the computer still has cards, true, so the computer won that time. 130 rounds, war happened 16 times. Let's run this one more time to make sure everything's working. Shuffling the deck, we'll say new, and then computer won again. Let's try to make sure the computer doesn't always win. And great, so the human player still has cards, true. And interesting enough, war happened zero times, and it was won in just 36 rounds. Okay, great. If you have any questions, feel free to post the Q&A forums. This is a very challenging project, so if you weren't able to get it on your own, especially given that we just learned about object-oriented programming, don't worry about it too much. We won't ever have to do something this complicated in Django. A lot of that work's already done for us. We just need to know the basics of adding methods to objects. We won't be doing anything this complicated when we talk about Django and building our own web applications. Again, any questions, make sure to check out the solutions.py file and check out the Q&A forums. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part four, errors and exceptions. Oftentimes, our code isn't going to be perfect, meaning we run into errors. And I'm sure by now you've actually ran into your own errors while trying to code out some of the examples in this course. But you may be wondering also, how do we actually set up our own error and exception calls? Let's find out. The key to all of this are these three keywords, try, accept, and finally. We can use them to dictate our code logic in case of an error. To show how this works, we're going to be opening files, and one way to open files is to use the open function. And the open function looks like this as a general example, where your first parameter is the actual file or path to the file, and the second parameter is a string code, indicating whether you're just going to be reading the file, writing to the file, or reading and writing to the file. So as I mentioned, that second parameter dictates how you're going to be opening the file. And if you accidentally use the wrong code, for instance, you say you're just going to read the file and then you attempt to write on the file, you may get an error. So we're going to be using this open function to actually show how we can handle errors. Let's hop over to the editor and get started. Okay, so here I am at the editor. To begin with, let's actually show what happens when we make a mistake and actually get an error out. So for instance, let's say I say print here, and I say hello, but for some reason I accidentally cut off that last single quote and messed up. If I try to run this notes.py file, saying python notes.py, and I hit enter, I get a syntax error, and it's EOL, or end of line, while scanning string literal, meaning the line suddenly ended and it expected more here. So that's one type of error you get. Notice it's called syntax error. Now let's say I do another error, where I say something like print my list, 
And for some reason, I forgot to define my list, or maybe I defined my list earlier, but I called it my list here. Set it equal to one, two, three, and later on in my code, I forgot it was my list here, and I just said my list. Let's save this and run this. Note, I get another error. This one's called name error, saying the name, my list, is not defined. And basically what this means is that we get these specific errors that are trying to help us out actually figure out what's wrong with our code. And this type of error and description is known as an exception. Even if a statement or expression is syntactically correct, it may cause an error when an attempt is made to actually execute that specific command. Errors detected during execution are called exceptions, and they're actually not unconditionally fatal. And what I mean by the phrase unconditionally fatal is that you can use those three keywords we talked about earlier to actually dictate how your code can handle those errors or exceptions and continue on with the rest of the script. That way, if something pops up, you can actually move with the punches and keep going. So let's show you how to use try and accept. The basic terminology and syntax used to handle errors are try, accept, and sometimes finally statements. Basically, it's code which can cause an exception is put inside the try block, and the handling of that exception is implemented in the accept block of code. Let me copy and paste the example syntax from the notes to show you. So I'm going to copy and paste some commented code here. Let's say control V, there we go. So the general syntax looks like this. You have a try and you do your operations inside this try statement. And like the keyword kind of implies, you're going to try to do this. You're going to attempt to do it. And then you have accept and exception one. So if there's exception one, and this exception one would be something like this, name error or syntax error. So you're kind of watching for a specific exception. Then you execute some certain block of code. Then you can have another accept if there's an exception two. So that's maybe one check is for a syntax error, another check is for a name error, etc. Then you execute this block. And then else, if there is no exception, you execute that block. So we can better understand this by actually walking through an example. Let me delete all this and inside of this same folder, I'm going to create a new file. It's going to be a simple text file. We'll say simple txt and it just says hello world. This is just a normal text file. Save that. And then inside of notes.py, I'm going to try to open this file. So I will say try and I will say f is equal to open and we'll pass in simple txt, that simple text. Now I'm going to open it with the parameter w as my second argument and then I'm going to write. So I will say test write to simple text. And then I'm going to say accept, and I will specify accept IO error, which is an in import output or input output operation error. And this will only check for an IO error exception and then execute a certain block of code. So let's print error could not find file or read data. And then finally we'll say else and I will print success. And then finally we need to close that file. So the basics of working with a file is you open it, you either read or write it, and then you close it. So let's actually run this and see what happens. So I'll call python notes.py and it looks like it was a success. So everything's working well. Now let's see what happens if I accidentally, instead of saying with W for write, I said R, which stands for read. And when you open a file with only R, that means you only have reading permissions on that file. You can't write to the file. And what's useful about only saying R is if you want to make sure your code doesn't accidentally write over a file, you make sure to only open it with the R permissions, meaning you can only read it. That way, if you accidentally write to the file, it won't happen. You'll get some sort of error. So let's clear the console and run that. And note here, instead of getting that sort of IO error, I get this error, could not find file or read data. And that's how this accepts works. Accept can look for a specific error and then instead of actually outputting what the error would usually output and stopping all your code, it prints error could not find the file or read data, and then we can have an else statement. And then we can actually keep going. So let's say I have something outside of this that says prints hello world, save that, run Python notes again, 
it says error, could not find file or read data, hello world. So what this try accept clause actually helps you do is handle errors and then continue on with your code. Let's imagine that I didn't actually use try, that I just tried to do this without this sort of block. So I comment all that out and then I just say f open simple text, I say f right, and then if I scroll all the way down, let's say after doing that, I try to print hello world. If I save this and run this, I get back this IO error, not writable, and I never actually output print hello world. This was fatal to my actual .py file. And the way we can use try and accept is to make these sort of exceptions not unconditionally fatal, meaning having your code being able to handle these sort of unexpected, or in this case, expected errors and continue on. And that's really the whole point of this. If you expect something wrong may occur or you have a certain condition that may actually mess up your code, you can counter it with an accept clause. Now, another thing you may be wondering is, well, how am I supposed to know what error is going to happen? I can't have all these error codes memorized. You know the basic one like syntax error or name error, but you may not have known IO error or other errors. What you can do is you actually don't need to give any error code. If you just have a general accept here, it's going to print on any sort of error. So let's save this and run this again. Python notes.py, it'll report back on error. So you don't actually need to specify the specific error. So a lot of times you're just gonna be writing accept there. Okay, so now let's introduce the finally keyword. And the finally key block of code will always be run regardless if there's an exception in the try code block. So right now, if you look at our code structure, we have try, which tries to do something, except, which is going to report back this block of code if there's an error here. And then we have the else, meaning if we don't actually have that exception, we'll say else, print success, and then F close. But what if we actually get an error, but wanna continue doing stuff inside of a block of code here? So instead of having like print hello world out here, what we can do is have the finally keyword. So I will add in a finally block, and then I'm going to say print I always work no matter what. And then let's save this and run this. And we see here, even though we got an error, we always get the finally block to occur. So I always work no matter what. Okay, that's really all we need to know for now about try, accept, and finally. As a quick note, these try blocks are not invulnerable to all errors. If you have an error that affects the try block itself, so for instance, if I close this off and I have the try block continuing on, I'm going to get an error here. So if I save this and then try something like Python notes.py, I will get here a syntax error. And it's not caught by this accept statement because the error is actually affecting the try accept finally statement itself. So it thinks that all of this belongs to this string and you have some sort of syntax error there. So accept is actually being messed up there. So again, you don't actually usually use try for something like a simple syntax mistake. You use it for larger blocks of code that are usually interacted with some sort of user input. That way you can handle any user mistakes that happen to affect your code. Again, the key words to know here are try, accept, and finally. Where you're going to try to execute some block of code, you'll say accept to try to catch certain exceptions, and a lot of times you're going to catch certain exceptions and print out something that's more useful than just syntax error, invalid syntax. Something useful like, hey, you had an error doing this specific operation, check this out, maybe review this line of code, etc. And then you have the finally block, which always works even if there's an exception. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part eight, regular expressions. Regular expressions allow us to search for patterns in Python strings, and they can seem incredibly intimidating at first due to their strange syntax. We're going to be walking through the basics of regular expressions, and we will use them in Django when we talk about URLs. All right, let's get started. Okay, let's begin with the very basics of regular expressions, and we can start by importing the RE module for regular expressions. 
And one of the most common use cases for the regular expression module is to find patterns in text. So I'm going to create a list called patterns and we'll say term one and term two. So these are the patterns I'm going to be looking for. And then I'm going to have some text to actually parse. So we'll say this is a string with term one, but not the other. So no, it has term one inside of it, but it doesn't have the actual other term. And then what I'm going to do is say for pattern in patterns, I'm going to say print, I'm searching for, and then I'm going to say pattern. So if we save and run this right now, it shouldn't be anything of much consequence, but let's make sure everything's working. So Python notes.py, hit enter, it says I'm searching for term one, I'm searching for term two. So let's show you how you can use a regular expressions module to actually make that search. So I'm first gonna check if there's a match. So I call re dot, and then the search function for that. And it takes two main parameters, the pattern and the string. So it scans through the string to find the pattern. So the first thing I'm going to do is say search, pass in the pattern I'm looking for, and then pass in the text I want to search for. And this returns true if it finds a match. So if we find the match, we're going to say match. Else we'll say print no match. Save this, and now let's run the code. And here we can say, when I search for term one, I find the match because it's inside that text. I'm searching for term two, there is no match, it's not inside that text. So re.search, very simple function. You pass in the pattern you're looking for and the text you wanna search, and you get back a Boolean value indicating if it's inside that. Now, often you don't want the actual Boolean value, you want the actual location. And if we take a closer look at this re.search, we'll notice that it doesn't actually return a straight Boolean value. It's actually not true or false. It returns a special match type. It returns a match object. And let me show that to you by getting rid of this. And let's take this all out of that if loop. And instead of saying re search, I'm going to say uh, match is equal to this. And let's take, get rid of that colon here. And then I'm going to say print the type of that match object. Save this, run our code again, and whoops, let's actually say term one. Let's just do one of them here. So I don't need this patterns anymore. Save this, now let's run it. And look what we get here. Before we were treating it as just a straight Boolean value, but it's actually this special regular expressions match object. So what does that actually mean? Well, this match object returned by the search method is more than just that Boolean or none. It contains information about the match. So this object already contains information about where the match starts and where the match ends. And I can grab it just by saying this, match.start, close parentheses. And if I run this, I actually get back uh, an integer. Whoops, that should have been outside of this type. Save this and now run it again. Now I can see it starts at index position 22 within this string. And to prove that to you, let's make this text just say term one. So I would expect the match to begin straight at index zero. So if I run this code again, I get back the number zero here, which makes sense because my match starts at zero. And regular expressions also have the ability to split a string on a particular pattern. So if I say something like, let's say split term, so split term is equal to, we'll call it the at symbol. Maybe we want to split something. I can say that my phrase, well, I'll just say email, is equal to user at gmail.com. And then instead of re.search, I can say re split, and then grab the split term, and then pass in the email address. And let's just print that out and see what we get. Save that, we can comment that out, and then run our code. And note here, I get a split on that at symbol, user and Gmail. And we've seen this before. This is actually built in already to strings, so you could just say split 
as a method off of this on the at symbol. But it comes from the regular expression library. So just keep that in mind. It's already built into strings. Okay, so we learned how to find the match and we learned how to do a split. Now a lot of times there are more complicated patterns that you're going to be looking for. Or maybe you want to find all the instances of a pattern. And you can use re.findall to find all the instances of a pattern in a string. Let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to clear all of this and clear this as well. And I will say re.findall and note that uh, Adam's actually helping us here. Again, it just takes a pattern in a string and returns a list of all non-overlapping matches in the string. So I say something like match and then let's say test phrase match in middle and I actually print the results of this out so I can see it when I run my code. I will save this, run python notes.py and here I can see I get a list of match. And if I add match one more time in there, run this again, I can see I get a list of two matches. So I could also just check the length of find all. Okay, so we learned about the very basics of regular expression library calls, that split, that search call, the match object. But what we're really going to be spending the bulk of this lecture when using regular expressions is what is known as the meta character syntax. And if you've programmed with Perl before, this sort of syntax is going to be familiar with you. But probably for the most of you, it's going to seem really strange at first. But don't worry, the idea here is not to memorize everything we show, but just to be able to use it as a reference. Come back to this lecture or look up regular expression plus Python on Google and be able to answer your own questions. But let's start off by actually just showing an example. And in order to show examples, uh, multiple examples at once actually, we are going to create a helper function. And this helper function is going to be called multi re find. And what it does is it's going to take in a list of patterns and some phrase. And then it's going to go through those patterns. So for pat in patterns, what we're going to do is say print searching for pattern. And then let's say dot format and I'll pass in pat there. And then I'm going to print re find all of pat in the phrase. And then I will print a new line because we're going to do this multiple times. So let's save that. And that's a function we're going to be using often. So let's start off with repetition syntax. And there are five ways to express repetition in a pattern. A pattern followed by the meta character asterisk is repeated zero or more times. So for instance, let's get a test phrase here. And this test phrase is going to be sdsd dot dot sssddd dot dot sddd sddd and you can copy and paste this from the notes so you don't have to listen to me talk um, and then we have d a bunch of s's three dots here and then s and a bunch of d's okay so the test pattern that i'm first going to test out here so test patterns, again, it's a list, and I'm going to say SD asterisk. So here's my test pattern, and what this stands for is I want to find an S followed by zero or more Ds. And keep in mind that kind of strange wording, zero or more Ds. So what we're going to do now is call multi re find with my test patterns, and I'm going to pass in my test phrase. Let's save this and run this and see what we get out. So if I scroll up here, I pretty much get back every instance of where there is an S. I get SD, S, SDDD, etc. Which makes sense because with, when you're using the asterisk, this returns this pattern, SD, followed by anything repeated zero or more times. So essentially you're kind of asking for almost anything. Anything that starts with an S at least. So again, the key thing with this asterisk, and let me kind of separate this out so we can kind of get an idea here, it's going to be an S followed by zero or more Ds. And the asterisk is attached to that D there. And later on, we'll show you how to attach it to more than one letter. Okay, so that's not very helpful to just search for anywhere where there's an S followed by zero or more Ds. 
So if we want it by one or more of these, we put a plus sign. So if we look at the results here, this was zero or more of these, which basically asked for anywhere there's an S. Now if I run it with one or more of these, I get back these values. And this makes a lot more sense. Here I get S, where it's followed by any count of these. Now, if I want it to be just zero or one time, I can input a question mark. So I'm going to input a question mark here, save this, run it again, and now I get back where it was either zero or one time. Again, not very helpful, but it is available to you. That's the question mark syntax. You'll probably want to know, how do I define a specific count? So let's say I want to know, when is it followed by three Ds? We'll use these curly brackets, pass in the number you're interested in, and then run the code. And here I can see wherever it was followed by three Ds, which happen to be three instances here. The first one here, second one here, third one here, and then fourth one over here. If you want to specify two numbers, maybe you're looking for two or three Ds, you can just pass in two comma three in this, run the code again, and we see here two or three Ds. In this case, there's no case. So let's try to make this one, run this again, and now I see one or three Ds. Great. Okay, so so far we've shown those special characters, what the asterisk stands for, the plus sign, the question mark, and then curly brackets. Again, an asterisk followed by zero or more, a plus sign followed by one or more, the question mark followed by either zero or one, and then the curly brackets where you can define the actual number or pass in a list of numbers. So far, if I show you what we've done, like SD plus, that looks for S followed by one or more Ds. Let's say I wanted to find S followed by several letters or several singular letters. So I want to know where S is followed by either S or D. So again, not together, but separate here. So let me know is basically what I'm asking here where S is followed by one or more S's or one or more D's. So if I save this and run this, we're gonna get back a lot of results. So here are all the cases where the letter S is followed by either one or more S's or one or more D's. And this makes sense as far as our result because it basically shows you any statement that started with an S. So this statement started with an S here, started with an S here, started with an S here, Note that we don't start with an S until we get to the second letter, so that gets SDS, here, SSSS, and then SDDD. Okay, kind of weird and confusing, I know, but again, we're looking more towards being able to reference this instead of memorizing it. Now I want to talk a little bit about exclusion, and we can use the caret symbol for exclusion. And let me show you how we can do that. So let's find a test phrase that isn't so uh, strange and do something like this is a string exclamation mark but it has punctuation period how can we remove it question mark all right so often you're going to get a string and you want to strip it of all punctuation and the way we can do that with regular expressions is by using the caret symbol which i type like this that caret symbol shift six um, to exclude terms and for example we do is we end up passing it inside of square brackets. So square brackets, caret symbol, and then you pass in any symbols that you're looking for. So for instance, we'll look for an exclamation mark, a period, a question mark, and then we say plus because we're looking for one or more instances of that, and that's the test pattern. Okay, so now if we run this, I say python notes.py, look at the result I get back. I essentially get back a list, so it's searching for the pattern here, but because it has this caret symbol, it's going to remove anywhere. You can essentially think of it as almost like a multiple split call. So here it's saying find all, but that special character, the caret, lets it know that I want to essentially remove all this. And then later, if I have this list, I could just uh, join it all back together or do whatever I wanted with those strings inside there. Okay, now let's discuss a few more examples that we probably won't run into during the course, but may be useful to actually see. One of those is a sequence of lowercase characters. You can just say lowercase a dash lowercase z, and this will return sequences of lowercase characters. So if I run this, now we see the sequences of all the lowercase characters. So this, you see the capital T has been removed. If I want sequences of uppercase characters, I just capitalize a through z here. 
run this, and then I get the capital letters. And there's a lot more you can do with this. Uh, it sequences of lower and uppercase letters, one uppercase letter followed by lowercase letters, etc. You can check out the notes for all those patterns, but we won't be using these too often. And then finally, you can use escape codes. There's special escape codes to find specific types of patterns in your data, such as digits, non-digits, white space, and more. And those are indicated using a backslash. So like I mentioned, the escapes are indicated by prefixing the character with a backslash. Unfortunately, a backslash must itself be escaped in a normal Python string. So the way we do that is by making it into a literal value with the letter R. And this is where it kind of looks really weird because it almost looks like it should give an error. But we type an R outside of the string there, then a backslash, and then the special code for the escape. So for instance, D, and then we can say plus here. And this is the kind of regular expression that you look at it and it almost looks like a different language. You think it's an error, it's not gonna be Python, but this will actually work. And this will return back a sequence of digits. So let me change the string to something more appropriate with, this is a string with numbers, put in some numbers there and a symbol. And for the symbol, we can put something like hashtag. We will save that. And then if I run this code, I get back the numbers. So lowercase d is essentially a special character code saying search for those numbers or digits. If I want non-digits, that's a capital D. Run this and I get back all the non-digits. If I want sequence of white space, that's a lowercase s. Again, all of these with the escape uh, backslash and the r. And then I get a list of all the white space, not super useful, unless I want to count how much white space there is. Capital S for the non-white space, so we can get the idea that capital kind of goes with non. So this is all the non-white space. If I want all the alphanumeric characters, those are letters and numbers, I can do a lowercase w, and that gives me back all the uh, alphanumeric. If I want the non-alphanumeric, that's going to be something like the hashtag, I can do a capital W. And that gives me a bunch of blanks, and then I get the hashtag there. So those spaces are also non-alphanumeric. Okay, so in conclusion by now, you should have a solid understanding of how to be able to reference the regular expressions. Now there are a ton of more special character instances, and if I say something in the Django sections that we haven't covered yet, I'll be sure to kind of give a little extra explanation of what we're doing. We won't do anything super intense with regular expressions in Django. Essentially, we'll be just using them with URLs to kind of figure out okay, am I going to .com slash admin or slash views slash URL slash et cetera. Okay, hopefully uh, you weren't super intimidated by this and you got a little bit of a good feel for what to expect when you're viewing regular expressions. Again, I don't expect you to memorize any of this. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part six, modules and packages. You've seen Python import statements before, but you've probably wondered how do they work and how do we create our own? It's actually quite simple and we'll talk about it more when we actually reach Django, but let's find out the very basics of modules and get started with the editor. Okay, so here I am at the editor and in this lecture, we're basically just going to be showing you how you can create your own module and then import it into another file. So here under my project folder, I'm going to right click, add a new file and I will call this my module dot pi. And here it's just going to be a very simple function. We'll say func in module, close parentheses, and this just prints out I am inside the my module dot pi, whoops, dot pi file. Save that. And then I will create a new file and I will call this my program.py, and this is going to be representative of my program. So we can even do something like split left and right here so I can see both of them at the same time. So again, there's my module and here's my program, and we can see they're both inside the same folder. So how can I actually grab code from my module.py and use it in my program? Well, there's various ways, and I'll show you the simplest first. We can say import my module, and note that there's other things here. So there's the 
built-in modules and the modules you use conda install or pip install with and those are saved in a specific location in Python that you can always call them from no matter where you are. In this case, since I'm actually in the same folder as this py file, I can call my module. And then if I want to call a function from my module, I can say my module dot function module. And then I can say close parentheses to actually call it. So now if I say Python and call my program dot pi, I get back, I am inside my module.py file. And when you ran that file, you probably noticed that you got this pycache folder. And inside this pycache folder is some mymodule.cpythoncode.pyc. And if you try to open that and read it, there's just a bunch of junk in here that you're not going to be able to actually see. And basically what happens is when you run a program in Python, the interpreter compiles it to bytecode first. And that's kind of an oversimplification, but essentially it stores that in the pycache folder. And if you look in there, you find a bunch of files sharing the names of the .py files in your projects folder. Only their extensions are going to be .pyc. And essentially what this is, it's bytecode compiled and optimized bytecode compiled versions of your program's file. And if you're just a programmer, you can essentially just ignore it. All it does is it makes your program start a little faster the next time you run it. And when your scripts change, they're going to be recompiled. And if you delete the files or the whole folder and run your program again, they're going to reappear. Again. Really, you can just pretty much ignore this PyCache file. But I just want you to be aware, and don't be surprised if you see it being created. OK, moving along, let's show you the other various ways you can import from a module. So one way, again, import the actual file and then call it off my module. Another way is to say, import my module as something. So you don't want to write my module every time you want to use a function for my module. So maybe you say, import as mm. And then you can shorten my module here to just mm. And I save that. I run Python on my program.py, and I still get I am inside the module.py file. So that's another way you can call it. If you actually just plan on using a few specific functions from my module.py, you probably don't want to import the entire module. You just want to import a few functions. And in that case, you can say from my module import and then the name of the function or classes you want to import. So we say import function module. And then I don't need to call anything prefacing it or prefixing it. We'll just say function module, run this, and I can see I am inside of my module.py file. Now let's see one last example, and this is the example that I'm going to show you, but it's really not recommended you do this. You can say from my module import asterisk, and this will import everything from my module and you can just call function module just like we did last time. So this is uh, frowned upon. You shouldn't really do this sort of asterisk behavior, but basically the reason for that is it kind of wastes a lot of memory in importing everything with this asterisk. Okay, so again, use the first three methods I showed you, and you can always reference the notes for that. But hopefully now you have a basic understanding of how you can create one py file with a bunch of functions or classes, and then call it from another py file. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, welcome to part 5, Decorators. Decorators are an advanced tool in Python, and I want you to feel free to skip this lecture and come back to it at another time. Since we won't actually encounter decorators until much further on into the advanced Django material, it might make more sense for you to skip this lecture, and once you encounter decorators in the Django sections of the course, come back to this and review decorators. Otherwise, you may find yourself understanding the syntax, but being a little forgetful by the time you actually reach the use case of decorators. Okay, so again, we leave this lecture in this section because material-wise, it makes the most sense to leave it here. But as far as using it in this course, I would recommend that you actually skip it for now and come back to it when you see decorators mentioned again. All right, with that all being said, let's get started. Okay, so to start off with decorators, they can be thought of as functions which modify the functionality of another function. And they really help make your code shorter and more Pythonic. And they're also used a lot in Python web frameworks, especially Django and Flask. Now you don't actually run into decorators in Django until much further along in your learning of Django. But to properly explain decorators, we're going to be slowly building up from functions. So let's break down all the steps. First, we'll start off with a very simple function review. Remember, if we want to create a function, we can just say def, the name of your function, any parameters you want to pass, and then you can say return, for instance, the number one. And if I want to call this function later, 
I just say func. And if I want to print something, I can say print func. Okay, so if I save this and I run this, hopefully by now you have no problems with this. It returns one, it all makes sense. Now let's discuss scope. So also remember from the scope lecture that I have global variables and local variables. So if I have the string s global variable and I save this, and then inside of this def func, I say something like take in s, and then I say print s, and I save this. And let's say over here, I just call func, well, whoops, func with s, excuse me. And then I run this, I get back global variable. And now if I don't provide s as a parameter to the function, and instead do this and run this again, it still works because here I don't have anything in the local namespace called s, so I jump back out and look for the global variable namespace for s, and I still find it, so I end up printing global variable. Now if I redefine s to be equal to 50 inside of this, save this, run this, I get back 50 when I call function. But if outside of this I call print s, save this, I get back 50 global variable. Remember, if I actually want to reassign not just the local variable s, but instead the global variable s, I have to say this, global s. Then I save that, run this again, and note back now I get 50, 50. So actually calling that global keyword calls in and tells me to affect the global, not just the local variable s. And there's actually a way you can grab a dictionary or a list of all locals, variables, and all global variables. And the way you can do that is inside of this function, just say print and then call locals. So locals returns a dictionary. Whoops locals, close parentheses, we're going to save that, and then I'm going to call the function here. So I can save this, run the code, and note here right now I have an empty dictionary because I don't have any local variables defined here. If I do define something like my local to be equal to 10, save this, run this, and now I see my local is 10. So that's just a convenient dictionary call to actually grab the local variables. Now if I say something like print globals, this will print out all the global variables. And there's going to be a lot here. So if I say python notes.py, I get this huge function of global variables. And that's because, not function, excuse me, a huge dictionary of global variables. And that is because there are a bunch of built-in things. So even though we haven't defined a whole lot yet, there are a lot of things. So there's notes.py is a global variable for the file. S here we saw is a global variable string. So I can also just call this like a dictionary. So globals, remember it's a dictionary, so if I call the key for s, and let's hashtag that out, I run this and I get back global variable. So printing globals at s finds this key value pair. Okay, so now that we remember what globals and locals are, let's start by continuing on with functions and function assignment. If I have a function called hello, and it takes in some parameter name, we'll have the default value be Jose, and I'm going to return hello plus whatever name is provided, and let's say I call print hello. I save this, run notes.py, and it says hello Jose. And we can put a space in there so it makes a little more sense. Now I can also assign a label to a function, meaning I can say my new greet and set it equal to hello. And note that I'm actually setting it equal to the function itself. I'm not setting it equal to what the function returns. I'm not doing these parentheses here. I'm setting it equal to the function itself, which means I could say this, my new greet, close parentheses, and print this out. So let's do that. Let's print out my new greet, save this, run this code, and I see now I have twice hello Jose, once from hello, and then since I define my new greet is equal to hello, I also get my new greet. And now that we understand how we can assign functions to new variables, let's continue on with functions within functions. Hopefully so far everything seems sort of like review. 
Now I'm going to create a function called hello again. It takes the default parameter name, Jose. And right off the top in this function, I'm going to print the hello function has been run. So if I ever call hello, I can see that the hello function has been run. So that makes sense so far. Now inside of def hello, I will define another function. And I will call this function greet. And what this does, it returns, note it returns, it's not printing, it returns something that says this string is inside greet. So if I run python notes.py, I shouldn't expect anything else to be a different because I don't actually call greet, I just define it here. And I'm going to do one more that says def welcome. And this returns this string is inside welcome. And we can save that. Again, if I run this code, I shouldn't expect anything different to happen because I'm only defining these functions inside of this function. I'm not actually calling them. Now, and pay attention here to the indentation. With the same indentation, let's zoom out a little bit so we can see all of this. So with the same indentation still inside the EF hello, what I'm going to do is say print greet. And then I'm also going to print welcome. And I'm going to say print end of hello. So now if I save this and I actually call the function hello, note back, I get the hello function has been run. I get the string is inside greet. So I actually define greet and call greet here. And then I define welcome and also call welcome. And then I get end of hello. And remember, because of scope, I cannot call greet or welcome outside of this. So I cannot say, whoops, I can call hello. But if I try to call welcome outside of the scope of this function, and you can quickly check what's inside this function by just collapsing that entire function here. So I run this welcome, I will get an error. It says name welcome is not defined because welcome is only inside the scope of the hello function. So keep that in mind. All right, so that's the basics of functions within functions. And I promise this will build up to decorators. Now let's talk about returning functions, something we haven't actually seen yet. So let's say this. Inside of my hello function, I will say if my name is equal to Jose, we'll put in lowercase Jose, return greet. So note here, I'm, I'm returning a function. We haven't actually seen that before. And then I will say else return another function. We'll return the welcome function. I'm not saying return the call of welcome function, I'm saying return the actual function itself, meaning it's returning this entire function, not just the string itself. And now I will say this, x is equal to hello, close parentheses, and then I'm going to say save this. If I run python notes.py, all I see is hello function has been run, but I don't know yet what has actually been returned. So I can do this x, close parentheses. If I run that, it says hello function has been run. And because this was just a return string, I need to actually print this out. So I can say print x, run this, and now it says the string is inside greet. So again, let's break down what's happening here. I'm saying if the default name is equal to Jose, which is the case, if name is equal to Jose, return the greet function. And the greet function is this entire thing. And the greet function just says in itself, return this string. So then I set x equal to the result of hello. And by default, the name is Jose, meaning I'm returning x to be equal to greet. So this is the exact same thing as saying x is equal to greet, except if it was happening inside of this function. So remember x, hello, and then I can call x, since it's now greet, and print out its result, which is this string is inside greet. Okay, really take your time with this one. 
This is kind of one of those jumps that might be a little confusing at first, but it's actually not so bad. Again, we're just returning a function, assigning it to a variable, and then calling that variable's function and printing it out because it returned the string. Now we have one last concept to go over before we actually talk about decorators, which is a function as an argument. So I'm going to delete all this code and say def hello, and it will return hi Jose. And then I'm going to create another function, we'll say other, and it's actually going to take in a parameter func. And then it's going to print hello. And then it's also going to print func. We'll save this. And I'm going to pass in a function as an argument. So I will call my other function and I will pass in the hello function. And keep in mind, I'm not passing what the hello function returns. I'm passing the function itself. So I don't have open and close parentheses at the end of hello. So if I run notes.py, I get back here function hello at this, which means if I actually run this inside of the other function with close parentheses here, now I should see hello, hi, Jose. So again, make sure you really understand what's going on here. I'm passing in a function as an argument. And then inside of the other function, I can call that function. So again, here we can see we can pass in function as arguments, just like we could pass strings, numbers, dictionaries, etc. We can pass in functions themselves inside of another function and then play around with them. And now it's time to actually show the basic steps to create a decorator, which has to do with all of the concepts we just covered. So in the previous example, we essentially manually created a decorator. So let's show it and modify this to make it really clear. I'll create a function called new underscore decorator. And this takes in some function. And then inside of this function, I define another one that says wrap underscore func. Doesn't take any parameters. And it's going to print code here before executing func. And then here, I will execute func. And remember, I can call func because it's in that namespace. And then after that, I'm going to print func has been called. And then outside of all this, I'm going to return wrap func. And then I'm going to create a new function called func needs decorator. And I'm going to have it just print. No, it's not returning, it's just printing. The, this function, if I can spell, is in need of a decorator. So let's start off with a simple example, which happens when I call func needs a decorator. So if I just call that run python notes.py, it says this function is in need of a decorator. That makes sense so far. But what happens if I actually reassign it to say func needs decorator is equal to the new decorator with func needs decorator passed inside of it. So if I run this and then call func needs decorator, save that, run python notes.py, it says code here, well let's actually expand this a little more, it says code here before executing func, this function is in need of a decorator, func has been called. So what happened here? The decorator simply wrapped the function and modified its behavior. And all of this code can be rewritten with the at symbol. So again, what's happening here is mainly all in line 13. Remember, I have this original function that needed a decorator. It just does a simple print command. And I'm now passing it as an argument inside of new decorator. And inside of that, I'm calling it inside of this wrap function and returning that wrap function. And all of this can be done with the at symbol. So let me show you what that actually looks like. I can say here, instead of these lines, so I will actually just comment this out so you can compare. So I have the func needs a decorator equal to new decorator with the func needs a decorator. Instead of that sort of 
reassignment, I can use the at keyword and type in the name of the decorator I want, which is at new decorator, and then call a function, the func needs decorator. Well, I can actually call it, I would basically type this entire thing. So we can just grab this special keyword, that at keyword, and this is the same thing as doing this. So now if I call func needs decorator, save this, and I'm about to run this, but remember what happened. I said code here before executing function. This function is in need of a decorator. Func has been called. I run this and I get back the exact same thing. So the key point of all of we talked about is this, that if you ever had a situation where you would need to pass a function that needed a decorator into a new decorator and then reassign it, that's all going to be done with this simple at call. So the new decorator with this at symbol call is the same as doing this. And that's all we wanted to get across. Now you might be wondering, when the heck am I ever going to need to do something like this? Well, it's not really clear now, and it won't be clear until we actually show you an example with Django much further along in the course. But hopefully you actually watched that already and came back to this because you were confused on what the heck we were doing with the decorator. And I hope now this made it all clear. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, welcome to part seven, name and main. An often confusing part of Python, especially as you begin to learn about modules, is this mysterious line of code that looks something like this. If name is equal to main, and then some code underneath it. Well, sometimes when you're importing from a module, you would like to know whether a module's function is being used as an import, or if you're using the original.py file of that module. Let's explore this some more, but make sure to check out the full explanatory text file that's in this parts folder. Let's get started. Okay, here I am at the editor, and to get started, I'm going to make two files. I will make a one.py file, that's one.py, and I'm going to make another file that's called two.py, T-W-O dot P-Y. And then I can say a split left or split right, and then I can see them side by side. Okay, so again, as I mentioned, sometimes when you're importing from a module, you would like to know whether a module's function is being used as an import or if you're using the actual original.py file. So as we saw before, if I'm importing something from two into one and I run the one.py script, I wanna know did that function directly come from one or was it imported from two? And you can determine this by using that if name is equal to main statement. And when your script is run by passing it as a command to the Python interpreter, such as we've done with Python notes.py, all of the code that is at the indentation level zero gets executed. And functions and classes that are defined are well defined, but none of their code gets ran. Unlike other languages, there's no main function that gets run automatically. The main function is implicitly all the code at the top level. And in this case, that top level code is that of an if block. And that's the if name is equal to main. So let's actually show this. I'm going to, in my one.py file, say def of a func, and here I will say print func in one.py, and we can collapse that tree. And then I'm going to print top level one.py, whoops. And then here I will say if, and note that I actually get this code automatically for me, so if underscore underscore name underscore underscore is equal to, and, and string there, main, and then it says execute main. But we're going to delete that for now and say print one.py is being run directly. And then I can actually have an else statement with this as well. Else print one.py is or has been imported. So I will save this and then in 2.py I'm going to write the following. I will say import one and then say print top level 2.py and then from one I will say call one.func and then I will say if again name is equal to main, 
print 2.py being run directly and then else and you don't often see an else but it can definitely work for an else we'll say 2 is being imported in other well I, I'll just say it's being imported now if we invoke the interpreter here with Python 1.py and I hit enter notice I get back out top level 1.py 1.py is being run directly and if I run python 2.py I get top level 1.py 1.py has been imported top level 2.py funkin 1.py 2.py is being run directly and all of this works because of this name so this underscore underscore name underscore underscore is a built-in variable which evaluates to the name of the current module. However, like I mentioned, if a module is being run directly, as in the 1.py or my script.py kind of deal, the name instead is being set to the string main. So whenever I run 2.py directly, then this variable name is set to equal main when I run it directly here. And thus, you can test whether or not your script is being run directly or being imported by something else. Okay, that's really all we wanted to get across here, that if you ever see if name is equal to main, it's basically a way of initiating the code in your main file, but also checking to see if you're importing functions from another file or calling them directly from the file you're currently in. So if you ever see this phrase or this line of code, don't be confused. A lot of times you will see it at the very bottom of a .py file and then all the main logic of the code will come here. So often you'll see a bunch of functions in a file that says .py, you get this line of code, and you see a bunch of code logic that uses the functions and classes defined above it. So hopefully you're not intimidated if you see it again. Definitely read the notes for this, but as far as this course is concerned, that's really all you need to know. The basics of how you can set this up to determine whether you're using something directly or importing it. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture.